is Free Talk Live. It's your show, and you can take control of the airwaves via our toll-free number, 1-800-259-9231. That is the SACL CAI toll-free line. That's 800-259-9231. It's Ian here with you. And Julia. And Mark. You can join us online. Freetalklive.com is the place to go. The features on our site, we give them away, so enjoy those on us. That is freetalklive.com. On the way, I I promised uh, we would talk a little bit more about intellectual property that's coming up, uh, perhaps maybe global warming, and of course anything you want to bring up. Let's go right to the phones to start things out. Amplifier Line and Will in Hawaii. You're on Free Talk Live. Will. Hey, I have a couple things I'd like to talk about. Um, sure. First is a brief story, and then I have a hypothetical scenario. Great. Okay. The first thing, uh, the story, um, my wife was recently going through some of her old um, high school notes and note cards from government high school. Uh, um, she was, she's been out for a little while, and she came across a note card that had a definition of anarchy. Hmm. Do you have any guess what it was? Oh, boy. Um, <laughs> lawless? Bomb throwers? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what I was expecting when she asked me, but this is going to blow your mind. It says, anarchy is the abolition of government as the necessary precondition for a free and just society. Interesting. Wow. Well, uh, unexpectedly, refreshingly honest. Yeah, that's that's what I thought. Very good. Sorry Very to strange. share that with you. Okay, and then the second thing was, um, I think it's probably a couple weeks ago now on the show where you had mentioned that one time when you were in North Bergen, New Jersey, you almost got killed by some guy. Well, I don't know if I almost got killed, but uh, I was chased down some one-way, one-way streets by some scary-looking guys uh, in a... Uh, in an SUV. The, the terminology you used, you were, you used were, was almost get killed. That's how I felt yeah. at that time. Yeah. Well, anyway, that got me thinking. Um, um, it's my understanding, I, I think, based on what you've said on previous shows, that if, if you died, then Julia would inherit the quote-unquote intellectual property of Free Talk Live. I and guess. I mean, I don't think we've I, ever, ever discussed really, that. I, I think Mark should inherit the intellectual property of Free Talk Live. <laughs> He's put in his dues. Julia, well, she's she's, hey, she's a Johnny Joni hey, come lately here. Who stayed after the Liberty Forum to help like an hour clean up while you went to party with Ron Paul, huh? Hey, Me. I brought I brought you a damn sandwich at the Liberty Forum. I don't want to hear crap out of you. I brought my own sandwich. Well, I brought you the sandwich. I drove it and, here from Keene. And, Eric and Scott somebody ate else it. ate it. <laughs> <laughs> so what was your question, Will? I'm sorry. Well, yeah, so anyway, with that, you know, whatever the status of that was, and of course Mark's the, the main co-host, um, my question is for Mark and Julia, what would you guys do if Ian met an untimely death, you know, as far as the show with co-hosts and the format of the show, and of course you'd probably have to make a fairly quick decision. Well, um, what would you guys do? Let me let, let, let me jump in. First off, I don't think Julia can manage to make it, um, you know, on the uh, on what Ian makes it on as far as pay. So she'd have to keep her full time job currently, which would preclude her from being able to do some of the things that Ian's able to do. However, I'm the only one who knows how to run the show, so yeah. you'd need to get me and my notes to be able to do a show the next day. At the very least, I would have to, uh, you know, uh, pay Julia to run the board for a, a little while. Mm. But you know, I I really like uh, Gardner, and he has he holds uh, Ian's um, you know political views without being well I don't know weird, and um, he doesn't uh, you know antagonize the the callers nearly as much. But you know, Gardner's pretty good, and and I probably would uh, you know try to get him on as as much as possible too, and we'd have Julia on on a regular basis. But that's probably what we would do. Gardner's a very talented uh, uh, broadcaster. So would you try to take over the role as? I guess Ian's role now is the announcer or whatever you call it, or would, would you get other people to do that? I I don't know. I like sitting in the the, the, the Ed McMahon chair here. <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I've always done radio sales. I'm comfortable doing radio sales. I'm happy doing radio sales, and that's the part of the show that I really enjoy doing. The intros, the extras, and all the other things that Ian does, which you, you the myriad of things that go unseen that Ian does as far as putting the show online and and all that other stuff, I have no interest in doing. If it was up to Mark Edge, Free Talk Live would have n- not gotten to where it is. <laughs> it's true. There yeah. you go, Will. Any other thoughts? Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I, I guess, of course, Gardner you know, could do that, all that stuff, but you know, he has a... He has his own show now. Well, so. Julia would have to would have to do part of it. Um, she would have to put and it in line. And you'd have to bargain with me. 
Yeah. I've got the key here. I'm the only one who knows how to run the board. It's true. So She's holding the cards. <laughs> okay, I guess that's it. I just was curious about that. Yes, we have a contingency plan. There you go, okay. Will. Thanks we for the do. call. We appreciate Bye. it. We just made one up right now. <laughs> 800-259-9231. Apparently the contingency plan is I kiss Julia's butt. It's a nice butt I'm to kiss. I'm reasonable. <laughs> like I should be so lucky. 1-800-259-9231. Let's talk about uh, the idea, the concept of intellectual property. We touched on it last night. Of course, Mark, you you sort of, you know, you're with me on some of the, some things. Like you're not really a huge fan of patents, but you can see some reasons for them. You think that patents, for instance, uh, help help with innovation, but at the same time, you also understand that they can be used by lawyers to uh, steal ideas or to rip off uh, inventors and sit on their ideas. and there, you, you acknowledge some problems with the existing patents. Sure. Would that be correct? Yes. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, uh, intellectual property is more than just patents. It also includes copyrights, and uh, I'm sure there's some other stuff that I'm not thinking of right now. So if you are, you, you know, you're certainly welcome to comment on this, but I've got it. Finally, uh, Robert down in Georgia sent me this link. And it's great because it's by Stephen Kinsella, who is sort of the the libertarian scholarly expert when it comes to intellectual property. This guy, at one time I found a 50-page long PDF file uh, about intellectual property and just, you know, it's with citations and very, very sort of scholarly sort of file, right, um, information. And I, I, I trudged through as much of it as I could. I just don't have... I really just didn't have time, or I didn't want to make the time to, to read all 50-something pages. But I read read some of it. It was very, very good. Very good information. Obviously, way too long to be read on the air. So this one... And that scholarly stuff is just not airworthy. Yeah. This one is a little bit more, a little more mass market, a little more understandable, and a lot shorter. So he pretty much boils down his 50 pages into eh, a few paragraphs. And I want to share that with you, because it's it's... This is an issue that divides libertarians. You know, we talk about liberty-oriented topics on this show a lot, and in many cases, we agree. You know, we do, we certainly agree that uh, getting the government out of our lives as much as possible is a desirable thing, mm -hmm. and uh, we agree on a lot of issues. But on some issues, libertarians are just rabid uh, at one another. You know, at one another over like abortions, one of them, and obviously, I don't want to go there today. No, but, we're talking uh, about intellectual property. But intellectual property is another one, and it's certainly a more, well, intellectual discussion. Uh, it, it, it covers a, a lot of areas of life as far as, you know, products and services and that sort of thing. And uh, well, a lot of people that are producing what they consider intellectual property, maybe artists or musicians, are very, very concerned and rightfully so about this issue. So it, it resonates. Now, uh, what I'm interested in finding is... A libertarian, and I mean a libertarian, a, a small government libertarian, somebody who believes that the government has a role or is necessary or something like that, that envisions the perfect world containing some sort of small government. Yeah. Um, I'm interested in finding that libertarian that believes that intellectual property is wrong and immoral and all that other stuff. Because it seems to me that the an ANCAPs or the uh, anarcho-capitalists or the free, marketeers. the free marketeers, whatever term you wish to use, the people that don't believe in a government at all – have sort of um, co-opted the – you know, they, they realize that uh, in intellectual property is an important issue, so they believe that because they, don't believe, because they don't believe in government, they don't believe in intellectual property. It's not the other way around, generally. That's just what I'm generally seeing. So I'm interested in hearing from a small government libertarian that does not, not – not an ANCAP posing as a small um, libertarian, small government libertarian, but in fact a small government libertarian that doesn't believe in intellectual property. I'll tell you what I do. I'll see if I can pull up a bio for Stephen Kinsella to find out what his belief system is. I don't know what it is. But well, that's if it's on I... the Internet, he's probably uh, not wanting to be labeled as a uh, anarcho-capitalist, so he is uh... – Who knows? I mean many scholarly types could care less what they're labeled yeah, as. that's true. Uh, and so – We'll uh, we'll definitely get into this here, and, and and I came to the conclusion through that manner that you suggested, Mark, that you know I've al I'd already dispensed with the idea of government. It's just a matter of figuring out how to get from here to there, basically. Mm -hmm. And so when the topic of intellectual property came up, I knew that I couldn't support government monopoly privilege uh, via because patents you didn't believe or, in government or copyrights. And so I support the marketplace deciding. And what does that mean? Well, I don't know. It's up to the marketplace. Will the marketplace be able to come up with? Uh, Revolutionary ways to protect ideas? Perhaps so. Are the, we, or are we throwing out babies with bathwater? Or are we giving lawyers the uh, the ability to take people's ideas and profit from them? More on the way. It's Free Talk Live. This is Free Talk Live. 
Free Talk Live, your show. You bring up anything. The toll-free number is 1-800-259-9231. Sickle CAI toll-free line. That's 800-259-9231. It is Ian here with you. And Julia. And Mark. And you can join us online at freetalklive.com. All the features on the site we give away, so enjoy those on us. And that, again, is freetalklive.com. And those features include the wiki over 1,400 pages created by listeners just like you. You can get interactive for free, of course. Go to wiki.freetalklive.com. That's W-I-K-I dot freetalklive dot com. Free Talk Live is brought to you by the Free State Project, your only choice for more personal freedom and smaller, less intrusive government. To learn more about joining the Second American Revolution, go to freestateproject.org. That's freestateproject.org. Okay, Stephen Kinsella, or Kinsella, rather, is the author of uh, a lot of stuff about intellectual property. He's really done his research. He's, uh, according to Wikipedia, he's an American intellectual property lawyer. So he's actually in the business. Mm. Uh, and lib- libertarian legal theorist. His electronically published works are primarily published in his blog and websites associated with the Ludwig von Mises Institute and anarcho-capitalist organizations. Uh, so he's a practicing attorney and uh, blah, blah, blah. So it doesn't really specifically say here if he is or is not an anarcho-capitalist, but one could certainly presume I'm going to go ahead such. and draw that conclusion. Safe, I think it's a safe presumption at this point. So from stephenkinsella.com, the question is, do patents and copyrights undermine private property? And the answer is yes. They're a burden to marketplace transactions, and they discourage business startups. Because one of the common arguments you'll hear, and he'll, he'll address it in here, one of the common arguments you'll hear is that, well, without intellectual property laws, no one will do research and development. And therefore, no new ideas will come out, or very few new ideas will come out, because they'll be afraid of somebody ripping off their ideas, and so on and so forth. Let's get started. He says property and liberty are in, intricately linked. In fact, property, not representative government or majority rule, exemplifies freedom. Property is a sphere in which the individual can be free of government. The historical role of private property as countervailing to the uh, the power of the state cannot be overstated. Equally strong is the relationship between strong private property rights and prosperity. If nothing else, the dismal economic failure of socialism has demonstrated what transpires when private ownership of the means of production is abolished. There's going to be a lot in here that you agree with, Mark. I mean, you oh, like yeah. private property, and you want the government off of your land and all that good stuff. Largely, um, you know, the, the, it's, it's minutia uh, that, that uh, separates, you know, somebody who believes in no government and somebody who believes in small government. Well, now, to somebody who makes uh, art and music for a living, this is not a mi- minute issue. This no. is This is critical. He says the insidious and persistent encroachment on property by the modern welfare state has, however, resulted in a complete confusion about the nature of ownership. By undermining the ethical foundations upon which property rests, the welfare state has made it morally acceptable to give people access to property they don't own. Property grabs run uh, run the gamut from taxation, welfare programs, forfeitures, and environmental and antitrust legislation to the more subtle interference with freedom of contract inherent in minimum wage laws and affirmative hiring. Copyright and patent grants of privilege are another form of property infringement, courtesy of the state. While they have their origins in a much earlier privilege given to friends of the crown in their modern incarnation, they blend in with the welfare state's wealth-distributing impetus. Far from being natural, property rights grounded in the common law, patent and copyright are monopoly privileges granted solely by state legislation. Copyright gives authors of original works, like books, the exclusive rights to copy the work or to prepare derivative works based on the original. A patent gives an inventor the right to stop others from making, using, or selling the patented invention. In both cases, the whole... Something I'd like to point out uh, that's also a difference between patents and copyrights that uh, people don't generally know is that if you and I were to write um, the exact same book, somehow or another, we managed to come up with exactly the same book, but we did it without um, ever referencing the other person or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Somehow or another, I never snuck snuck a peek at your book, and you never snuck a peek at mine. Then we could both copyright that book and... Or, we, you know, we couldn't prove that the other one did so. We could copyright that book, and there wouldn't be a problem. But as far as a patent goes, the first one to get that book to patent, if there were a patent for books, um, let's say it's an invention, would then own the invention. Even if we invented the same thing uniquely without the other's involvement, the person who invented it first gets the patent. And I think that that particularly is what's wrong with patent law. 
In both cases, the holder of this right is given legal contract over how others use their property. As the author of a differently hued Gone with the Wind recently found out, the copyright holder can stop you from using your own paper and ink to publish a novel that reproduces the copyrighted work or one based on its plot. So I don't know if you're right about that, Mark. If you and I were to write the same book across the country from one another and you got a copyright and I got a copyright, but there would be a dispute and you could take I, that to court. If I No, it's not, that's not true. If I wrote something based on Gone with the Wind... I have written something based on Gone with the Wind. I didn't just write some novel that happened to have those words. You know, I mean, it's it's a safe assumption that everybody in America, large or a large amount of Mer- people in America, have heard about Gone with the Wind. And then if you write something using Scarlet O'Hare oh, and Red Butler, then then in fact you are stealing the the characters, the gotcha. intellectual property of that author, whomever it might be. In this case, the estate of Margaret Mitchell, the author of Gone with the Wind, is suing Alice Randall to block her from publishing the parody The Wind Done Gone. (laughs) (laughs) That's funny. (laughs) Randall tells the famous tale from the perspective of black slaves. The mere act of creation, composing a song, penning a novel, or inventing a mousetrap, gives the creator control over the tangible property of others. In addition to allowing the author partially to control the paper, ink, computer, and photocopies of others, copyright in particular restricts not only our rights to our property, but to our very bodies. Consider the choreographer of a dance who gets the right to stop another from moving his body in a certain fashion. Um, also, you know, another good example of this, um, and this is against my argument, would be, you know, for instance, uh, a fashion designer that doesn't, you know, it, there are no patents in fashion That's design. correct, and they still make it. And somehow or another, they manage to make it. Absolutely true. But, you know, they sort of, it's sort of the big fashion companies that set the scene for the uh, $10 shirts or whatever that you get at uh, Marshall's. Mm-hmm. So um, there's no copyright, and you know it takes a couple of years to trickle on down through the fashion industry. But basically, the uh, the the little guys, the the cheapies, manage to uh, take all the designs from the innovators out there. By the way, Julia has been very upset recently. Uh, she's been looking on the just on the side note of fashion. She's been looking for a pair of jeans. W- will you describe what you're looking for, okay. Julia? Maybe one of our listeners can post a link on the BBS to somewhere where you can actually order something like this. Okay. I'm looking for regular blue jeans. They do not exist. All blue jeans nowadays, unless they are old lady blue jeans, I want them to fit nicely. I don't want them to be super tight, but I don't want to wear old lady jeans. But anyway, they're all pre-faded, pre-ripped, pre-stained, or they have those ugly like lines down them. Ugly I can't, lines? I can't explain like it. Like the, uh, the sort of like the wear lines, yes. bleach lines. And, yeah, and they're vertical I, they're, lines. I despise those pants. I refuse to wear them, and I cannot find a pair of blue jeans, men's or women's, and it frustrates me. She went all what frustrates town. me is back in 1986, you could find a full outfit. I'm talking about uh, the jean boots, the blue jeans, the uh, a Canadian tuxedo, jack, right? The the jacket, the whole thing, and you could find it in stonewashed denim, and you just can't find that crap anymore. She went store to store, and everywhere in Keene. Could I even used stores? Could not find a pair of just plain old blue jeans. They don't exist. Because apparently the hot thing these days is to and have your pants torn up. But it's been like that for a few up, years. Uh, or to have uh, make it look like they, they've What's been What's wrong just, with that? I've got my jeans are torn. End? Well, she's not going to have pants to wear, apparently. So uh, if anybody can help her with that, post over to the BBS <laughs> or email her at julia at freetalklive.com. More on the way about intellectual property. This is Free Talk Live. George Phillies is the right candidate for president, a serious, well-educated candidate who stands for the basic principles of liberty and the basic principles of this nation. Paid for by Phillies 2008. This is George Phillies, libertarian for president. I approved of this message. This is Free Talk Live. It's your show, and you take control of the airwaves toll-free at 1-800-259-9231. Get a hold of yourselves. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not laughing. Look, I've been doing this long enough. I know. You're not allowed to laugh when the mics are on. 1-800-259-9231. The SACL CAI toll-free line. You can join us online at freetalklive.com. The updates are there. Get signed up. We will keep you clued in whenever there's something fresh to announce about the show. You'll know first if you're on the updates list, updates.freetalklive.com. The Republican Liberty Caucus welcomes new members in the pursuit of 
individual rights, limited government, and mom jeans, all within <laughs> the GOP. Visit rlc.org and click join us today. We'll find liberty together. That's rlc.org. We'll jump back into uh, intellectual property here in a moment, but uh, as an aside, whenever somebody comes back laughing, I always feel obligated to explain why, because it's rude to the listeners to come back and laugh and, and not tell them what's up. Uh, we, of course, uh, went away a moment ago talking about jeans and how Julia is has been on a quest to find some... Well, regular colored jeans, not the new fangled uh, ripped jeans. You know, the pre-ripped. You buy these jeans with holes in them already. Uh, you also now they have this the the, the faded ones that jeans. look like there's faded and then there's worse than faded, which is faded and looks like I've been rolling around in dirt. Those ones are that's, the that's worst. Sort of brown. Yeah, yeah, those gross me out. So uh, so she'd been They're looking rusty. and looking. She can't find anything. So we threw it out over the air and said if anybody has any suggestions. But now you're saying you don't want to order online. So I, I, I'm sorry I even asked our listeners for help. I mean. You're not going to ever be able to find jeans that way if you aren't, aren't even interested. We have, in... we have managed to discover during the break that Julia doesn't, in fact, want regular jeans. She wants, um, you know, nice. I want fitting. jeans that I bought when I was in 13. I want them to fit nice. She wants and I the don't... sort of bell bottomies to fit a little low to show off her, her booty to everybody, but she doesn't. <laughs> but she wants them blue, blue, like regular blue jean blue. She doesn't want your standard. I don't five think she wants Levi's. them that tight in the booty, though. I don't think she's interested in that. Le- Levi's 501s. She doesn't want that. She's right. not interested. In the, the the mom jeans, you know. <laughs> so okay, we were so about that's why. Mom jeans. In right. fact, she wants something very unique. I Just guess like so. me, she's pining for the days when um of when you could get a full um you know outfit in uh, stonewashed jeans. There you go. Stonewashed well, right. denim. So now you understand. Eight hundred two five nine ninety two thirty one. We're talking about pro- uh, so called intellectual property and the argument against it. Stephen Kinsella at stephenkinsella dot com is uh, commenting. And he's already pointed out that he's going to talk about copyright, and he's going to talk about patents. And he points out that the government monopoly privilege, known as patents and copyright, basically prevent others, if you are the patent holder, it prevents others from doing the same thing with their own property. So if you've painted a Picasso, and uh, you you have uh, used your own paint and your own canvas, then... You violated, well, I guess he's not holding a copyright on that, but you get my point. You violated intellectual property laws, and therefore you can be arrested or fined or whatever the, you know, the the trouble you'll get into is. It's um, usually handled through our uh, court system. So basically he's pointing out that it prevents you from using your property how you want. He goes on, First Amendment rights to freedom of speech are also compromised. A recent court order atta- obtained by factions of the entertainment industry decreed that source code, which is uh, the computer programs that you run, is not protected free speech, and that studios have a right to suppress it. What's next? Do we unleash the force of law against the of, against a devotee who recites computer code on a street corner? It gets worse. You don't have to be guilty of copyright violation to be constrained. Doing something that might result in some third party making prohibited copies will suffice. A particularly rank example of prior restraint legislation is the Audio Home Recording Act of 1992. Manufacturers of digital recording devices are compelled by law to incorporate technology that prevents copying. They're penalized in anticipation of possible infractions. Manufacturers are also made to pony up royalties in lieu of each device of blank media sold. Ditto for consumers who pay through excise taxes. Did you know that? No, I didn't. I, I had heard that at one point, that uh, when you buy a bunch of blank CDs, Sony or you know Philips or whoever it is that's manufacturing those CDs is paying royalty fees out to you know the RIAA and those guys in advance, just presuming you're going to burn music to the CDs. Hmm. Well, yeah. then, then there shouldn't be any problem if I do. <laughs> yeah, right. Patents, however, take the cake, says Stephen. The patent holder can prevent others from practicing invention, even if, as is quite common, they arrive at the process quite independently. Happen to think of a new way to tune your car engine to get better gas mileage? Better hope someone else doesn't have a patent on that technique. He could stop you from twiddling with your own 1967 Mustang in your own garage. Thinking of dashing off a quick software filing program to streamline your business? Think again. Quote, software-driven multi-host storage solutions for powering advanced business applications, unquote, are being patented at a furious rate. Stripped of baffled gab, this mouthful means that for the privilege of filing, albeit electronically, you will have to pay extortion money to a patent holder. It gets scarier when you consider that 20,000 software patents are issued annually. 
price-inflating patent monopolies have grave consequences for undeveloped nations, as the latest patent imbroglio unfurling in South Africa suggests. The government of South Africa enacted legislation to allow parallel importing of and uh, domestic production of generic AIDS drugs to help deal with the AIDS crisis. The multinational pharmaceutical kingpins moved in to enforce their patent monopolies, plunging South Africa into a life-and-death battle. South African firms presumably have not stolen their equipment, neither have they trespassed or broken an, ent- uh, broken an entry to obtain the molecular combinations for AZT, 3TC, or DDI. These are in the public domain, so why should South Africans be prohibited from making these drugs? Given that it's generally a bad thing through legislation to transfer control of property from owner to non-owner, uh, what possibly is the justification for such laws? Well, most proponents view intellectual property, or IP, as a matter of utility. Without such laws, the argument goes, we would be deprived of clever inventions and beautiful works of art. To the utilitarians, the costs of monopoly privileges, not least the violation of property rights, are outweighed by the benefits of having wonderful inventions. I would I, Well, I don't know that the uh, benefits necessarily are wonderful um, inventions. I would say that, yes, uh, I, intellectual property laws do change the face of invention. But I also think that uh, you know that there's there's some good arguments for it. I would say yes, those arguments are utilitarian. I would concur with him. Utilitarians turned a blind eye to the staggering sums that companies spend on the fees of patent attorneys who prepare, file, and defend patent applications, mostly for defensive purposes. Litigation costs millions. Mergers between companies often occur for no other reason than to settle patent disputes or to allow the merging parties to compete with a rival with a large patent armory. Submarine patents can emerge at any time, only to sink a high-tech company. Like, uh, you remember the uh, the BlackBerry thing from last year where yeah. uh, BlackBerry had come out with this wonderful, or whoever's behind BlackBerry, I don't know what the company name is, but this, you know, this company had come out with this device that allows you to check emails and do all kinds of cool things remotely. And uh, then somebody, you know, surfaced with a patent complaint and, uh, you know, they went, went to court and they shut down their network and it was just, uh, it was just a mess. The threat of patents increases overall business risk and can torpedo marginal or startup companies. If patents and copyright are essential to innovation, as the mantra goes, how is it that Day Dawns and the perfume maker who owns no odor rights still is marketing high-end perfume that can be easily knocked off? Philosophers uh, persist in writing their tomes, uh, mathematicians toil at solving age-old riddles, and physicists don't tire from probing the universe. How does all this creativity continue without the reward of a monopolistic ownership in the ensuing ideas? And why is it fair for the law to protect practical gizmos, but not more abstract ideas such as Einstein's equation of E equals MC squared? Or not protect the uh, the perfume manufacturer? Well, and and the, li- the line that separates them uh, is where really the rub comes in. For instance, uh, some uh, companies have patented the human genomes. That's scary stuff, dude. and it's just—it's like crustless in- peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Absolutely true. Um, the you know they've they've uh, patented computer programs, which like you've pointed out, are really just X's and O's. Where does the line get drawn? Now, I I would agree that uh, computer programs uh, deserve some protection, but what kinds? So well, this is again. Now he doesn't. I don't even think address this. But what you're addressing is the inefficiency of bureaucracy. I would. And the fact that uh, you know we're leaving it to the government, to these government bureaucrats, to make decisions and the lawyers to make decisions about what should be protected and to what extent it should be protected. And you know everybody else gets left out of the cold. But yet they manage to do business. The clothing manufacturers manage to design new clothing that gets ripped off and sold for less. The uh, the perfume manufacturers manage to design new per, uh, perfumes and sell them at, you know, the price of gold. And they're still doing all right. More on the way. This is Free Talk Live. This is Free Talk Live. It's your show. And you can take control of the airwaves. The toll-free number is 1-800-259-9231. That's the SACL CAI toll-free line, 800-259-9231. It's Ian here with you. And Julia. And Mark. And you can join us online. Freetalklive.com is the place to go. The features on the site, we give them away, so enjoy those on us. And if you like the show and you want to help support Free Talk Live, then you can go and shop with us at Amazon.FreeTalkLive.com. When you enter Amazon through that link, Free Talk Live gets a percentage of your purchase. There's 41 categories to shop in, free super saver shipping on a whole bunch of items, and uh, just 
great deals. I mean, a huge selection. You can get virtually anything you might need for life, including groceries. Head over to Amazon.FreeTalkLive.com. Great way to help the show and get the stuff you need. So wrapping up thoughts on the intellectual property debate from Stephen Kinsella.com, who is a, an intellectual property attorney that doesn't believe in intellectual property. Very interesting. Interesting position to be in in life. And so he knows his stuff, and he's pointing out he's pointed out several things to us, talking about copyrights and patents. And, of course, uh, he hasn't really touched on the fact that the bureaucracy just sucks. I mean, government bureaucracy, they set rules arbitrarily based on, you know, whoever's in charge and what they want to do. And, of course, that means that everything from, as you say, uh, Julia, a, pe- a crustless peanut butter and jelly sandwich, there's actually a patent for that, right? right? Which I'm pretty sure I invented that. Uh, the, everything from th- stupid stuff like that all the way on up to complex uh, inventions can be patented, while other things can't be. Uh, fragrances, clothing, um, you know, con- conceptual ideas like E equals MC squared. Anyway, he goes on to say, so far we've highlighted how intellectual property rights interfere with the freedom of others to use their own bodies or their justly acquired property in certain ways. But why should they not be accorded this right? Why should tangible goods be the proper objects of property rights instead of intangible, such as the ideas that IP laws protect? Here we arrive at the nub of the issue. Thomas Jefferson wrote, and he himself was an inventor, quote, He who receives an idea from me receives instruction himself without lessening mine, as he who lights his taper at mine receives light without darkening me, unquote. Jefferson was very definitely not articulating the fatuous information-wants-to-be-free argument made by the left regarding IP. He was, however, enunciating what is the essence of ownable property. Ownable property is only that which is economically scarce, and by economic scarcity we mean that, absent clear demarcation, conflict will arise as to who owns the resource. Land, cars, printing presses, paper, and ink are scarce in the sense that if we remove them from you, you no longer have them. Our use of an item conflicts with your use of it. While an abundance of computers can be had on the market, our use of this particular personal computer excludes your use of it. If we would conjure computers with a genie gesture, they would be abundant and not scarce. And it would be immaterial if this one were removed. You could just poof, conjure another one. Mm -hmm. However, valuable ideas are not economically scarce. Our listening to a piece of music doesn't conflict with or exclude your doing the same. A copy made of a book doesn't remove from its author the configuration of ideas that is the book. Ideas very plainly can be jointly consumed without dissipating. Of course, the end product of an idea, to wit a book or compact disc, is very definitely scarce. True to John Locke, we say that if you purchase the book or buy the CD, you are its rightful sole owner. Proponents of IP, intellectual property, however, say that some distant author or musician partially may colonize your book and CD and tell you how to use them. How do we allay the fear that without patent and copyright, we would all perish? Consider this. How many tears would you shed if Bill Gates were only worth several, not dozens, of billions? Since Microsoft owns a good portion of its wealth, or owes, rather, a good portion of its wealth to the copyright monopoly, this would be the upshot of its removal. If the company relied only on profits from initial sales and from support services, would that be so bad? Being first on the market is its own reward. The various spin-offs and short-term advantages that accrue to innovators who develop new products provide sufficient incentive and profit to render patent protection unnecessary. Removal of patent protection often can accelerate research and development efforts. No sooner had Eli Lilly been stripped of its patent uh, patent protection for Prozac than the company pledged a renewed commitment to innovation. This was reflected in investor confidence and climbing stock prices. Innovators can and do fence their products. As intellectual property scholar Tom Palmer points out, concerts and circuses are fenced in events with tickets sold and checked at the door. There already are assorted blank recording media on the market that scramble signals beyond recognition, making reproduction impossible. Bundling of products is a viable option as are tie-ins. These arrangements wed a product to a service. Television broadcasts are already tied to advertising, as are so many other goods. Computer programs are bundled with manuals or service features. The customer would rather purchase the product and get access to free maintenance than resort to copying. Because when you download a computer piece of computer software off the Internet, you don't get to call the company and ask them questions. No, you don't. Right. Uh, really. You, do, you know, when it comes to uh, certain programs, it's just a lot easier. The company makes it significantly easier to use their product if you buy it from them than if you try to get it off the Internet for 
one, the copying it off the internet is not easy generally, and under the current circumstances, you have to be, you know, a little knowledgeable to do now, that. Sort not of. to say that in in the world of no uh, IP, it wouldn't be rather easy, but. Contracts, of course, inherently are free market friendly, but also in a world of no IP, it's very unlikely anyone's going to set up a call center to field tech support calls from people who didn't actually buy the original uh, product. Not necessarily. Um, you know, for instance, uh, Apple could uh, sell Microsoft's uh, software and then uh, use their existing call center and, and just decide that they were going to do that. But then again, Microsoft could do the same. That's true. Unlike intellectual property rights, uh, contracts, of course, are inherently free market friendly. Unlike intellectual property rights, they're voluntary. And they bind only the parties to the agreement. There are leasing ar arrangements, too. Companies can enforce their property rights in the end product of the idea, the tangible good. They then lend the thing out subject to conditions specified in a contract. Patent and copyright clearly undermine private property. A staunch defense of private property must lead to anti-intellectual property conclusions. So there. 1-800-259-9231. You're welcome to comment on the uh, the IP thing or whatever might happen to be on your mind. Uh, you know, any uh, any comments from the uh, the peanut gallery here? Well, I personally don't think that the government should be dealing in intellectual property. I don't really believe necessarily in inter inter in I can't speak intellectual property. I think the fashion comment is is perfect because. Mark's right. There are these high-end fashion designers. And Burberry, then Gucci. Right. And then there's lower end. And people can tell the difference. And people still buy the high end because they like they like it. They Look at like the girls it. with their purses, right? right. The uh, $1,500 purses or whatever they, they cost. They can tell the difference between a real $1,500 purse and a $50 purse. They can tell the difference. And, and you'd think the Chinese manufacturers that are making the knockoffs, you'd think they'd figure out ways to make it more difficult for people to tell the difference. But sure enough, there are guides out there. There are these little subtleties that you can look for. Uh, for instance, I was looking at a, an article the other day about you know fake Rolexes and how you can tell the difference when you go to New York City or Hong Kong or whatever. People are going to offer you these imitation Rolexes. Or on, on eBay. Uh, and, well, you know, at least in person, you have a much better chance of actually identifying a, a knockoff. Mm -hmm. And if it's being sold sold by a guy who's opening his coat pocket to you. Chances uh, are good. Probably a knockoff. But uh, they, they ran down some of the very subtle differences between the two. Uh, for instance, it says that apparently with a fake Rolex, and I don't even have it in front of me, this is from memory. It says that one of the key differences is that Rolexes do not tick. They just sort of roll through the seconds. <laughs> and it has something to do with the fact that they have a very precision mechanism that probably cost them a lot of money to develop and, and implement. perpetual. Uh, is that what it's called? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, they have this precision mechanism in there that, uh, you know, makes their product very, very special. And, you know, the Chinese manufacturers just don't want to pay whatever it costs to put those into their products. No, no. So, uh, so it's very interesting. I remember my, uh, my ex-girlfriend at one time went to a knockoff party. There was somebody who would, I guess, travel around and bring a bunch of knockoff purses and that sort of thing to someone's home, sort of like a Tupperware party, but... For knockoffs. <laughs> and you'd go there and you'd see all these, you know, Burberry purses, but they weren't really Burberry purses or whatever the other hot brands are. They had them all. And they were at a, at a fraction of the cost that you would pay for the actual brand. And, of course, there's also a level of sort of elitism that goes on with this, right? Oh, right. sure. Of these young girls or girls, are, I guess they're not all young girls, but girls who are into the brand names, if they find out you've got a knockoff, what happens? Well, I certainly don't associate with people of that sort, you so used it's to. difficult for me to say, yeah, you'd be outed. Yeah, you'd be outed of, as a, a poser. Ostracized. Oh, I don't think that they, they would, first they would uh, talk about it behind your behind back. Behind your back, they'd and giggle. They'd make sure, and, and make sure that it was disseminated amongst everyone that they could find out that, that in fact what you had was a knockoff. Right. But, you know, I have to say that anybody who would spend $1,500 on a purse is the one that this, um, really be des laughed at. deserves to be laughed at I behind agree. their back. It's like everybody has different preferences. Sure. I, I buy some things. I buy, I'll buy. i buy uh, sugar that isn't the real store, for example, but there are some things where I would like the real brand. So it just depends. There's some food right. items I wouldn't buy real brand. And there's right. Some what you're saying makes makes me want to retract what I said. If you have enough money to pay $1,500 for a handbag, please, by all means, go right ahead. Right. You're going into credit card debt, on the other hand. If you are middle class, if you are even upper middle class, and you have the expectation, especially that uh, some man in your life is going to buy a $1,500 uh, handbag for you, <laughs> you're a bad person. Yeah. More on the way. You can take control of the airwaves. The toll-free number is 800-259-9231. We're getting ready to head into hour number two. And coming up... 
We'll talk about plastic surgery, among other things. This is your show. It's Free Talk Live. Would you like to help others find Free Talk Live? You can help us advertise, market, and promote the show at amp.freetalklive.com. Consider becoming a Free Talk Live amplifier now for $3 a month and get some cool bonuses at amp.freetalklive.com. This is Free Talk Live. It's your show. You can take control of the airwaves toll-free, 800-259-9231, SACL CAI toll-free line. That's 1-800-259-9231 as we roll into hour number two. It's Ian here with you. And Julia. And Mark. You can join us online at freetalklive.com. The features on the site are for free, so enjoy those on us. That is freetalklive.com. Let's roll right into the phone calls and start things out with Tom in New Hampshire. Tom, you're on Free Talk Live. Hello there. Tom. Hi there. Hey. I just wanted to point something out because you get a lot of people uh, who uh, don't really care about other people's rights. That's and right. They they vote and they don't care about uh, you know the cops going out doing racial profiling and enforcing unjust laws. Right, because they they're white care. and uh, wealthy, so they'll never get caught up in all that. Is the way they see it. The way they see it, they don't care about that. A lot of them are cop lovers, and they worship cops, and they, and they don't care about these things. But let me tell you a couple of stories here. Now, on 16 February 2004, this guy was just peacefully driving down the road, minding his own business in Detroit, Michigan, and he got pulled over for no apparent reason other than driving while black. Mm. He decided enough was enough, so he fought back. And uh, he, that was all for those cops, and he captured a 40 caliber handgun, which, by the way, fell back into enemy hands an hour later when he was captured, but the cops are still dead, both of them. So How's he doing? Is he still uh, <laughs> sucking air? Because I wouldn't imagine he is. Well, I, I don't know, but see, either way, the cops are still dead. So I would say let that be a lesson to the cops. You know, you can get the Bill of Rights through your head or you can get bullets through your head, but they'll choose the second option because the news media keep portraying them as fallen heroes even when they get themselves killed in the act of their own deliberate wrongdoing. That I've got to say, I, mean, I don't agree with you on everything, Tom, but I have to say that it really bugs me that whenever a cop dies, and what it doesn't really seem to matter what the circumstances are, uh, here in New Hampshire, there was a story recently about a, I guess, a, a cop had pulled a guy over that had some Franklin. incidents in the past, and the guy ended up shooting the cop. Of course, the cop was apparently this, you know, out of control rogue cop, and uh, right, and he had targeted this this guy, targeted this guy on multiple occasions right. in the past, and the guy ended up shooting. They had the a cop. history. And then uh, what happened was, uh, I guess someone else came along and shoot the original guy that shot uh, shot yeah. the original guy that shot the cop. Right, an ex-convict, uh, you know, saves, you know, or you know, re- avenges the cop. And then they have parades for the cop simply because yeah. he's a cop, and for some reason, because you're a cop, means you're better than everybody else. You're a hero automatically because you wear a uniform, and I think that that's uh, that's a little unfair, and I, it's mindless. Well, let, let the voters take notice that if their politicians don't straighten out the cops, the undertakers will. When you go into that voting booth, you've got two choices there, cops under control or cops under flowers. Usually, the, no. other, <laughs> the, the other story I wanted to tell you was a few weeks later on 31 March 2004 when the cops went to arrest this guy who was peacefully minding his own business, proudly serving local residents of the community by selling to them the methamphetamine that they wanted. <laughs> and the cops were ready for him, okay? They were ready for him, but they didn't really see there was another guy there that they weren't watching. They, they had their eyes and their concentration on their suspects. Mm-hmm. And this other guy took action and settled the matter out of court, and that was all for those cops. See, so, uh, you know, if you don't defend liberty with ballots, then other people are going to defend liberty with bullets, see? So So what's your message tonight, Tom? What's your message? There's four dead cops in your face, you people that vote wrong. If you don't like it, don't so you're saying if you don't want cops to continue to die, right. you should stop voting for these big government people. Right. The, for those that, that uh, really do think that cops are heroes, and, and uh, I, I think that they do a job that I really would not want to do, and uh, they do put themselves in harm's way. For those that think that cops are heroes, you would say vote small government so that they don't get uh, – you know, caught up in a bunch of in a in a mess that that was a, a not of their own doing. You're actually trying yeah, well, to save the cops, aren't you, Tom? In some weird, if, twisted if, way. If they, if they don't like it when the poor, def- 
defenseless cops get themselves killed, then don't ever pull a lever like that again. Thanks for the call, Tom. We appreciate mm-hmm. hearing from you at 800-259-9231. Free talk Tom sounds a little bitter. Free Talk Live does not advocate the uh, killing of the police. Uh, we think it's a bad idea. It's only going to get you killed, uh, and that's not something you want. Right. Is right? Tom out shooting cops? No, he's not. But his point does make sense in that... It's, it's pretty clear what size I, yeah, he's voting for. I understand for. what he's saying, but I certainly don't think that killing cops he's is the way to go He's just not the about. most eloquent about getting his point across. He's very, very brash. Well, he, you know, he believes what he believes. Uh, so one eight yes, you can call about anything on Free Talk Live eight hundred two five nine ninety two thirty one. As we continue with the phone calls and talk to Bill in Oklahoma. Bill, you're on Free Talk Live. Hello there. Thank you guys for taking my call. Thanks for being here. What's on your mind? Well, I have two points. Uh, first, I want to chime in on the intellectual property thing. Certainly. Um, being a software developer myself, um, I find it very discouraging when big companies such as Microsoft gets involved and levies mindless threats about how we're supposedly um, trampling on their intellectual property when they won't disclose what that intellectual property is. Case in point, the Linux distribution of of, uh, operating systems. Uh, Make long story short, they bully uh, Linux uh, distributors to make these partnerships to evade uh, lawsuits. To make partnerships? Uh, I don't understand. Well, basically, they, 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 uh, Microsoft goes in and says, okay, what we're going to do is we'll, we'll, we have your data rights. You have, you've trampled on our intellectual property. Uh, we have proof. No, we're not going to disclose what those intellectual properties are mm-hmm. uh, so that you can fix the problem. We're just going to go ahead and tell you that uh, we've got your data rights. And uh, we, we, we will be more than happy to not sue you. You will uh, just partner up with us. And then um, what? And so then they, they get to use the Linux. What, what is, what's they, the point of that for for Microsoft? Uh, Microsoft. Well, from a standpoint of an open source advocate, it basically says if you want to keep uh, certain technologies open, uh, you know, uh, acknowledge that. Uh, you know, basically, acknowledge that you're using our intellectual property. We're being nice guys. Uh, I guess it's like a like a mask of. Uh, we're being nice enough to let you use our intellectual property uh, to do your own thing. But rest assured that if, if at any time you, you, you make us mad, we're going to go in and take you to court. I see. So basically they have to sort of ba- – it's Microsoft making the uh, the Linux guys bow down to them. Is that what you're saying? That's pretty much – that's how I see it. Uh, and, and it appears as though they're not uh, – from what you're saying, and I don't know that that's, this is how Microsoft operates, but uh, – if you know they're they're not uh, revealing what it is that you're doing wrong and what way you're uh, violating their intellectual property rights, thereby, you know, essentially say, um, you know, it, it it doesn't allow you to fix anything, nor does it uh, you even know whether they have a valid claim or not. It's extortion because they know it's me that... coming to Ian and saying, hey, you're violating my in- intellectual property rights, and I'm going to take you to court. Right, and and these you know the Linux people, they don't have the money that Microsoft does. No, so they Micro- know they Microsoft can't play. can afford to go into to court for years and years and uh, pay all kinds of attorneys just to scare off anybody else who might think about going to court with them. Bill, your second point. And my second point was something that was brought up last night, I believe it was by you, Ian, uh, something of, uh, along the lines, and I'm just paraphrasing, you said that I didn't sign anything that made me obligated to pay uh, perennial uh, taxes. Federal uh, taxes, yeah. Yeah, federal taxes. You know, you, you don't have my signature on a piece of paper. I didn't agree to anything. I shouldn't be obligated. Well, I had an interesting conversation with a, um, a lawyer about this. Uh, it just came up, and basically there is a unwritten, uh, imp- uh, I guess you would call it an uh, implied uh, uh, oppression law. Basically, it's a blind consent. You just, by being in the United States, you just, uh, you basically consent to all the laws. Uh, I'm not that, in the United that- States. The United States is a, uh, is a fiction. It's a legal fiction. It's uh, another piece of paper, just like uh, so many other pieces of paper the government has written down. I live in a place that uh, some people call New Hampshire. I live on a plot of land. Uh, you know, if you want to call it the United States, that's your business. But uh, I've never agreed to anything in this concept. This is a t- common legal concept that uh, silence is consent. That's what. That's how most laws are written. In that, if you do not object, therefore you are consenting. Well, I'm letting it be known that I object. Thanks for the call. We appreciate it, Bill. Eight hundred two five nine ninety two thirty 
one. Like it or not, that's how the legal world works. If they come up with a bunch of new laws, you supposedly have consented because you have not rejected them, if that makes any sense. It's a little weird, but that's the legal word for you. Uh, for you. 800-259-9231. This is Free Talk Live. This is Free Talk Live. It's your show. You can take control of the airwaves toll free. 800-259-9231 is the SACL CAI toll free line. That's 1-800-259-9231, and it's Ian here with you. And Julia. And Mark. And you can join us online. Freetalklive.com is the place to go. We've got live streams. There's a broadband version of the show and a dial-up version, both waiting for you for free at freetalklive.com. If you or perhaps somebody you know needs a primer on some of the subjects that we talk about on Free Talk Live, you should check out the Liberty Radio, uh, Liberty Radio Underground. It's an elementary introduction to libertarianism, and each show concisely handles a single topic in under 10 minutes. It's great for somebody new to Liberty. Go to LibertyRadioUnderground.com. That's LibertyRadioUnderground.com. Grab an episode today. 800-259-9231. Let's go to the phones. To the fun, to Bill in New Hampshire on the Amplifier line. Hey, Bill. Hi, Julia, Ian, and Mark. Hello. Hey. What's on uh, your mind? I wanted to uh, talk about this intellectual property thing, sure. uh, especially in reference to computer programs. Okay. Okay. Uh, it's it's interesting uh, if if you think about you know uh, the present way computers are sold, where the software is already loaded on the hard drive and you don't get any disks with it. Mm-hmm. If anything ever happens to that, it's gone. Right? Don't so they normally buy? sell? They, don't they? I mean, are they not selling the uh, the, the restore disks? Because some computers used to come with those. I haven't bought a computer. I, I mean, I buy my I made my own computers from scratch. So you know, I don't know if they still come with those. No, with I didn't get any with my laptop. Really? Nothing. Right. Huh. No. I mean, if if you're going to make any sort of a backup, you're going to have to figure out how to do that yourself. It's not like you know, you go out and buy a book and you know you could put it on the shelf and come back to it five months later and read it again. Or if you buy a CD, you know, you just turn it off, and then turn it right back on, and you've got it there. If your hard drive crashes, it's gone. What if you, you know? uh, what if you registered with the company? Uh, if you, For whatever, some, some way or another, you can register most of your products with the company. Would you be able to get it then? I don't know this. I, I don't really know. I generally don't register with anyone yeah, for any me reason. Too. Um, but, you know, just, just recently, you know, I had an old copy of Microsoft Word on, on my computer, and, you know, we, we got uh, a brand new computer. It wiped it off my old hard drive, started to use the new one, and they weren't really clear that the new version expired. It was only sort of, you know, a, Trial. a, a temporary thing. Mm-hmm. So, so now they're both gone. Great. Mm. Yeah. So, so, you know, I'm, I'm sort of, uh, you know, wondering exactly, you know, how, how somebody's intellectual property rights supersede my property rights when I put out the cash. Well, now, in the world of software, as I understand it, now probably 99% of people have never read any of the agreements that they usually flash up on the screen before you're allowed to install a piece of software, which, of course, if you are buying a computer, then you technically don't agree to those agreements. But uh, for most software, when you click that, I accept, you know, there's that huge, sure. and, long... And there's 35 pages, yeah. Yeah, legal thing. Uh, as I understand it, the gist of that is that... Uh, that's Microsoft or whatever the company it is that's made the software telling you, no, Bill, you don't own this software. We own this software, and we are licensing it to you for, you know, whatever the term is. And uh, so we're going to let you use the software. So you don't actually, when you purchase software, you apparently do not actually own the software. Did you know that? Well, I mean, what good does a license do me if the software is not there? <laughs> I don't know. That's uh, it's an interesting right. case. So, I mean, this is this this is you know it basically boils down to deception. I think. Well, maybe they you just know, figure that they're selling me a bill of goods. Maybe they figure that computers are so cheap and so disposable these days that uh, if the hard drive crashes, you just go out and buy another computer and be done with it. I, I guess so, possibly. But I mean, I think it uh, the only thing that it does is really just uh, sort of foster contempt for. Uh, Microsoft and other companies that do the same thing and make people want to just sort of get back at them and download things off the Internet. Because, well, you know, Microsoft it, is big enough they can handle a little contempt. They, they really aren't concerned with that. Oh, I'm, I'm sure they can, but, you know, uh, you know well, Microsoft, we've got Linux. 
Yeah, Microsoft is not making their money off of uh, consumer sales of Windows XP or Windows Vista. I mean, they're, that's not where the bulk of their money comes from. The bulk of their money comes from licensing fees. Uh, it comes from the business side of their business, you know, the uh, the multi uh, – when a business goes and purchases a copy of Word for 200 computers or something like that. Sure. You know, that's where they really make bank. And so if, if there's a bunch of uh, pieces of Windows – if there's a lot of Windows installations that are illicit, Microsoft is certainly not interested in chasing that down. It's not worth their while legally to go after people like that. So, you know, they program in whatever sort of copyright protection they can program in. And then if it's if it's hacked and, and people get around it, then they don't really care. People are still using their software. So that's what's important. What's important to them is that Windows is installed on most computers. Whether it's legal or not, obviously Microsoft is never going to come out and say something like that. They're never going to come out and say, yeah, steal our software. But, yeah. <laughs> you know, they'd rather have you running a stolen copy of Windows XP than running Linux or running um, Mac or something like that, if that Probably. makes sense. Probably. I still think it's kind of unscrupulous that, you know, their, uh, their, their new versions of their soft software delete the old versions of the software and mm. leave you with nothing. Well, I'm sorry to hear that, Bill. Any other thoughts? Yep. That's about it. Thanks for the call, dude. Appreciate it. Have a good night. Yep, 800-259-9231. Yeah, Microsoft's never going to admit that one, but that's sort of the way I feel about things because the more people are out there using Microsoft software, uh, as far as Windows is concerned, the more valuable their licensing fees are for the the businesses that want to develop for Microsoft and, and all of that. I can see that. All right, 800-259-9231. Let's move on from this intellectual property thing and talk instead about plastic surgery. Now, Julia, I know you had a story. We talked about this actually a while back on the program. Yeah, and I think it upset some people, actually. Wait, what? Well, just my opinions in general on plastic surgery, which I don't necessarily think that plastic surgery is the worst thing on earth or anything like that. And I know that there are certainly a lot of people that do it, but I think that some people do it for the wrong reasons. And and I think that it gives people sort of this artificial, temporary feeling of satisfaction Mm -hmm. that goes away. And I think that if you're that unsatisfied with yourself... Um, plastic surgery isn't going to... A new to nose isn't going to solve the right. problem? Right, Or, so. you know, it'll only solve it temporarily, and then eventually you'll find something else wrong with yourself right. that you want to fix, but that this sort of thing? article, the title of it is Women Urge to Shun Trendy Plastic Surgery, but it's actually more specifically about genital plastic surgery, which is something that really kind of bugs me. Yeah, that's some disturbing stuff. <laughs> it's the strangest of the right, strange. Exactly. Because, I mean, you aren't really, at, at least with your nose or your cheeks or whatever, people see people that. People see it on a daily basis. Uh, the only people that are ever going to see your genitalia are somebody who someone you're who's really close. Sli- yeah, exactly. Really close with. And I'm sort of of the opinion that if somebody who you're close with sees your genitals and says, oh, that's... <laughs> <laughs> that maybe they're not the best for you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Might not be the uh, the knight in shining armor you thought so they were. <laughs> people are people were angry at you for taking that position? I don't think anybody was angry, but I there was Got that impression. R- that right. There was, you know, there were just people who who got the impression I think that I think that plastic surgery is the worst thing on the face of the earth and nobody should do it. Which is hmm. not the case. I think did that they email should... you or did you just no, hear No, it was things? on the BBS. Oh, I see. But, Which of course on the BBS they they'll talk about anything and yeah. and everything that they have to say is you know of of, of medical value. So plastic <laughs> surgery for genitalia. Now we're specifically talking about female genitalia. That's correct. correct but it's done on men, I'm sure. More on the way. We'll uh, in dig fact, in it this. Is done on men. I did a little research. I'll pull that website up. And of course oh, we're talking uh, clinically here. This is not to appeal to any prurient interest or anything like that. It's so just a quick disclaimer. To a. Uh, Quote the FCC. Yeah, 1-800-259-9231. This is your show. It is Free Talk Live. Our archives, website, and podcast will continue to stay free, but if you think other people deserve to hear this show, consider becoming a Free Talk Live amplifier for just $3 a month at amp.freetalklive.com. Help free some minds. Visit amp.freetalklive.com. This is Free Talk Live. It's your show, and you can bring up whatever you want. The toll-free number is 1-800-259-9231. Say go CAI toll-free line. Ian here with you. And Julia. And Mark. You can join us online at freetalklive.com. The feature's on our site, and we give them away. So enjoy those on us. Bulletin board system is there. Over a quarter of a million posts 
Lots to talk about, serious issues and fun stuff, all for free at bbs.freetalklive.com. That's bbs.freetalklive.com. And now you can save time and money on common legal matters. Created by top attorneys, LegalZoom.com helps you create reliable legal documents like your will or living trust in minutes. LegalZoom.com. Use code FTL, like Free Talk Live. That's code FTL to save 10% at LegalZoom.com. Now, before we get into the details on this story about the genitalia, the, uh, the female genitalia and plastic surgery and why women shouldn't be getting this surgery, uh, I've actually got a bit of a correction. Johnson, uh, our producer from far away, has emailed me uh, something from TechDirt.com that rebuts what I said about how Microsoft would never admit that piracy is, necess- is, uh, is a good thing for them. We were just talking about that a few moments ago. In fact, turns out Microsoft has admitted that. Uh, According to TechDirt.com, for some time, big software companies have tried to make the argument that a copy of pirated software is equivalent to a lost sale. This is pretty ridiculous for a couple of reasons. For one thing, there's no reason to think that a given user of pirated software would have actually purchased a legitimate copy. Furthermore, the argument ignores the fact that companies actually benefit in some ways from piracy, because a user of pirated software is likely to purchase software from the same maker at some point down the road. This latter point is something that even Bill Gates has admitted, even while Microsoft continues to talk tough about cracking down on piracy. So it's not like, it's not their prime message, it's not what they're out there pushing, but they have admitted it. Now the company is stating more clearly that it knows there are some benefits to piracy. Jeff Rakies, the head of the company's business group, said at a recent investor conference that while the company is against piracy, if you're going to pirate software, it hopes that you pirate Microsoft software. He cited the above reasoning, noting that users of pirated Microsoft software are likely to purchase from the company later on. He says the company wants to push for legal licensing, but doesn't want to push so hard so as to destroy a valuable part of its user base. See, Microsoft gets it, unlike the RIAA and these other agencies that are you know, going after people that are allegedly downloading music and that sort of thing. Microsoft understands that if it goes after its customers, people are going to get upset. If it goes after people that are pirating Windows, people are going to get angry and they'll be more likely to go to Linux or they'll go, you know, go to Apple or something. He said they, uh, the company recently got a stark reminder of this lesson when a school in Russia said it would switch to Linux to avoid future hassles with the pirate police. Of course, this moderate stance seems at odds with the company's recent hyper-aggressive anti-piracy push, which resulted in many mistaken piracy accusations. Either way, Rake's comments completely destroy the line about pirated software being equivalent to lost sales. If it actually were, Rake's would be telling people to pirate the software of Microsoft's competitors. So, very interesting. I did not realize they would be so honest. A little credit goes to them for that. All right, so let's talk about the uh, female genitalia, plastic surgery. Women are actually having plastic surgery on their labia, as I understand it? Well, there's actually a few of them, but that's the one that we talked about a few weeks ago, or months ago, I guess it was. So what's the story here, Julia, and where's it from? It's from the Chicago Tribune. Issuing a strong warning to women, a prominent physician's group stated Friday that there is no evidence cosmetic genital surgery is safe or effective. The statement by the American College of uh, blah, 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 said, mm-hmm. sorry about that. I That's okay. I accidentally slid down my mouse there and lost it. Uh, says that it is deceptive to give the impression that these procedures, which by some accounts are among the hottest new trends in plastic surgery, are accepted in routine surgical practices. I don't understand that this is a hot trend. I can't even believe that. I mean, when you originally talked about this on the show, I thought this is obscure. You know, only the well, maybe only porn freaks will get this because that's where the the origi- where it originally got popular, right? right? Is that the porn stars were having plastic surgery done on their, you know, their clitoris and their labia and that sort of thing. And uh, so other girls presumably watching that said, I want to have that done. And then they went out and did it. But you're telling me this is a trend? This is hot? That I guess girls it's getting are going more popular. This is spreading? Yes. Vaginal rejuvenation, designer vaginoplasty, revergination, which, what is that? What? Sounds like they're somehow using pla- uh, uh, plastic surgery to replace the hymen. The hymen, yeah. Which is kind of silly anyway, because the hymen isn't necessarily there by the time you lose your virginity anyway. That's Not true. necessarily. And if you believe in God, I don't think God's going to be fooled by uh, the plastic <laughs> surgery. 
and G spot amplification. That's as far as far as I understand it. I when we read the article, I went and looked at a couple of plastic surgery sites to see what people had to say about this sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And as I understand it, the G spot amplification, they stick some sort of a chemical in there to make your G spot more sensitive and larger. Sort of like a, a Botox injection for the G spot. Something like that. Okay. I don't know a lot about this. It's fairly new. I've never even heard of such things before okay. we came up across that article, but it's it's crazy. Yeah. I, I I'm n- almost never um, on the back end of any trend. I, I I generally know what's going on out there. I had no idea that they were uh, that, that this was being pushed. I guess this is the plastic surgery for the people that have already gotten all the other plastic right. surgery right. there is to get. All right. Well, these. Procedures are being marketed to women on late night TV and magazines and on the internet. Hmm. Doctors offering the procedures say they can enhance women's sexual pleasure, alleviate uncomfortable symptoms. Why and- do you need more enhancement? Well, I mean, th- hold on, th- th- that's something that you you just don't understand. Um, some women have a you know a hooded clitoris and it's difficult for them right. to have a you know a vaginal uh, orgasm. Um, you know, and yeah, I, I would say that there's some reasons right. for that. And Essentially, some women have orgasms more easily than others. Right. And there also are, it says, alleviate uncomfortable symptoms. There are some women, I heard a story, somebody posted a link to a story on the BBS of a woman who it was just very uncomfortable for her to go to the bathroom and had been for years because her labia were so large. And in circumstances like that, I mean, I guess I can understand. I don't personally have any experience with anything like that, so it's hard for me to put myself in that position. Um, but I think that just getting it done for the purpose of not liking the way it looks uh, or wanting your lover to like the way it looks better, I don't know. It hmm. just seems a little, first of all, risky and weird to well, the, me. Well, the women with the uh, the overgrown hood or whatever you're, you're referring to, um, it's not like they can't orgasm. It's just that they can't orgasm vaginally with, through intercourse is what you're saying. Or they're having more difficulty through intercourse. There would be other ways to bring them to orgasm, correct? It would depend on the woman and uh, her her particular problem. I see. So even non-intercoursal uh, oral stimulation would also be difficult? Is that what you're saying? Uh, so I understand. Huh, okay. But critics say... I don't these... know if it's worth taking a knife to it down there, but okay. <laughs> Guess it depends. If, if you never had a good orgasm and you want to have one, I mean... Everybody's talking about how great they are. Maybe it's very important to you. I, I maybe don't know. it's in your it's, head. It's difficult for me to put myself in that situation. Maybe you, you know, maybe you had some problems as a kid uh, that you know warped your mind, and daddy touched you the wrong way or something like that, and now you've got a mental block to your orgasm. Is it? Don't they say that it's all in your head uh, as far as sexual pleasure is concerned? Yes. Obviously, you have to have the organs in order to uh, to orgasm, but. I think there might be some other problems going on here. Sounds that's my uninformed opinion. Yep, that's what it sounds like. Yeah. <laughs> but critics say these women are exposing extraordinarily sensitive body parts to interventions with questionable benefits and unknown risks. Absence of data supporting the safety and efficiency of these procedures makes their recommendation untenable, said the Medical Group Group's Committee on uh, Gynecological Practice. Other experts express concern that pr- practitioners are offering surgical fixes to problems better addressed by correcting women's misconceptions about their body and boosting their self-esteem. If somebody doesn't like the way they look or their heart is broken, surgery is not going to fix that. These Mm -hmm. problems are above the belly button, not below. Absolutely. Yeah. An Internet search turns up dozens of sites promising to help women by surgically altering their genitals and repairing the after effects of childbirth. For physicians, the business typically cash only is a way to supplement income squeezed by cost-conscious insurers. Many of the sites are accompanied by graphic before and after pictures and glowing patient testimonials. Of course. I yeah. could post a testimonial that says, that's ruined my life. Well, it makes sense to me if it's for um, you know a real physiological reason, you know, you have a superior orgasm. If it's for uh, cosmetic that bothers me a little right. bit. Right. More on the way. You take control. This is Free Talk Live. Would you ever cut down there? This is Free Talk Live. It's your show, and you can bring up anything via the toll-free number, 800-259-9231. SACL CAI toll-free line. Ian here with you. And Julia. And Mark. You can join us online at freetalklive.com. All the features on the site, we give them away, so enjoy those on us. Uh, And if you like the show, you want to help support Free Talk Live, then become a Free Talk Live amplifier. Just go to amp.freetalklive.com and join the hundreds of our listeners who have decided that Free Talk Live is worth paying for. Uh, They've sent in three bucks a month. That's all we're asking for. 
And what we do with the money is we take it in and we turn it around into promoting the show, to getting on more radio stations across the country. So if that's valuable to you, head over to amp.freetalklive.com to learn more about the program and learn about some of the, the perks you'll get access to, like amp only call, the AMP-only call-in line, AMP-only chat room and forum, and more. All the details, amp.freetalklive.com. Ladies, uh, would you spend $6,500, and perhaps a little less, perhaps a little more, to have a doctor, a plastic surgeon, go down uh, with a knife and cut you in your private areas? Because apparently this is the hot new trend in plastic surgery. Breast enlargements, that's old hat. Actually, those are have been going up in numbers as well. Well, so it's, still, yeah. it's old hat in that they've been around forever. The people but who get these have likely about already there. had, had uh, <laughs> breast implants. But uh, now the new hot thing is labiaplasty, vaginoplasty, and hymenoplasty. Uh, three of the most popular surgeries going right now. And, uh, Julia, you're saying the Chicago Tribune has cited some experts who are telling ladies, whoa, be careful. Right. This is not proven. This may be dangerous. You may not be wanting to do this to yourself. And uh, give me some more details from this story, if you would, please. All right. It gives a couple of quotes here from doctors who do it. How grateful my patient, how grateful my patients are is unbelievable, says Dr. Bernard Stern, a board side of a uh, board certified gynecological surgeon in Florida who says I'm looking he's at his done website right now actually 850 cosmetic genital surgeries in the last 6 years. He says he gets 50 emails every night from a woman asking about the procedure. Not the same woman, obviously different no. women uh, giving him. <laughs> That's worth <it. laughs> She's really obsessed and weird. So <laughs> How many procedures? She does need help. Oh. 800? 850 is what he's done. At $5500, that's a cool 4.6 million for that doctor. Sweet. Well, you know, if he's providing a service that uh, yeah. you know, people want, I have no problem with him right. making a bundle of money on right. it. Right. I would I I I I do question um, why somebody would uh, get their genitals just for cosmetic purposes. Um, well, you know, now, their labia minora reduced. They're saying here the vaginoplasty, uh, it says that for women who've experienced multiple childbirths, vaginal muscles tend to experience enlargement due to stressful expansion. Kegels will help with that. Says even after Kegel, the condition of the muscles may not improve. Many women find that while the experience of childbirth may be the most rewarding of their lives, sometimes the after effects for both their sexual partner and themselves is not as satisfying as it once was. Uh, sometimes vaginoplasty is referred to as rejuvenation of the vagina. In uh, is a procedure that can usually correct the problem of the stretched vaginal muscles and is a direct means of enhancing one's sexual life again. And, and then they go into a little bit more detail about what goes on. So one could make the argument that, you know, there are some women that are just unsatisfied with things, and that's why they're doing this. Uh, but you're saying, Julia, that this still may be pretty dangerous. Well, I think that the problem is that a lot of women, its it started in porn, apparently. I did a teeny amount of research on it, and people, I think a lot of people watch porn, and they think that that is how sex is supposed to be, that is how women are supposed to look, mm -hmm. and so I think a lot of women see this sort of thing, and then if they don't look exactly like that, they think, well, something's wrong with me. That's unhealthy. And that's unhealthy, to exactly. Think that way. yeah. And I, I think everybody should do whatever is best for them. And if you feel like this is something that you should do, go for it. I'm not against plastic surgery. I just sort of question the reasons behind it. Hmm. And I don't think that it's necessarily the healthiest choice. Okay, so the doctor's saying his patients are very satisfied, of course. That's right. right. Uh, among oh, yet other organ sorry, I skipped a paragraph. Yet other medical organizations share the ACOG's concern. I know of no medical reason to do these surgeries and no scientific data that proves There's no that medical are, reason to have breast enlargements. That's true. Uh, proves that they are beneficial, says Dr. Thomas E. Nolan, uh, president of the Society of Gynecolo Gynecological yeah. <laughs> Surgeons. Among the treatments, doctors are offering only labiaplasty, which involves trimming and reshaping part of the external genitalia is well documented in scientific literature. Now that one couldn't possibly have anything to do with increasing sexual pleasure, right? The labia, the trimming right. of the labia? They're a highly, highly sensitive area and you would think that if it was, I mean, there was more of it that it like that yeah, would have absolutely you're reducing, nothing to do with... reducing the nerve count for sure and uh, it certainly doesn't have anything to do with childbirth or, or whatever the vaginoplasty is all about. Right. That's purely for appearance. Correct. 
That's the that is the breast enlargement uh, of the uh, vagina. Well, basically. it's actually interesting um, that you bring that up because a few weeks ago on the BBS there was a, a topic. Somebody said, "Well, we like people who look young. We like." Women, it's very popular, for example, for women to be men? shaven. Yeah, I guess we as a society, we like okay, men yeah. shaven. Both men and women, we like them shaven. And essentially, when a woman gets this done, they look like a little girl. So it, Okay. Uh, people like to look young. Which, of course, uh, people weren't shaven as much back in the 70s and that sort of thing, at least if you're judging by pornography and yeah. what else do you have to judge by. Um so I don't know if that's necessarily true what that person was saying, but you're saying... It was saying an interesting, that, yeah, interesting it was a point. idea. Right. That's what I'm saying. It was an interesting idea. And if you look at the before and after pictures, essentially they look like young girls when they're done with this surgery. Mm. Because that... Well, anyway, I, I can't really you're say that. You're just making an observation. Yeah. Yes, exactly. I'm not saying that that is scientific or anything. It's just an interesting point. Yeah. In contrast, many doctors don't even accept the existence of the purported pleasure center known as the G-spot, much less approve of injections meant to enhance it. I don't know what the G-spot is, says Dr. Melvin Melvin Gerby, chief of gynecology at Northwestern Memorial Hospital. As for revirgination, Gerby said any doctor performing it at Northwestern would be in trouble. (laughs) Yeah, that seems like madness to me. Very strange. I don't even know why one would want that done. I don't understand what the point would be. No I one, don't know either. No one would be able to tell that you weren't a virgin by having sex with you. So because the hymen isn't right. necessarily intact when you what have do they sex do? For Stick the first a blood time. pack up there so the first time you uh, you know you have sex after the surgery it looks like the real thing. Which that's not even necessarily you know, they can pull true. A skin over there. I mean the hymen's just a little bit of skin in front of the uh, vaginal opening. All right. Opening. Well, here's what it is: a hymenoplasty. The procedure involves reattaching the tissue torn when a woman first has sex. But I don't think that a man would notice that. So I don't understand what the purpose of that surgery would be at all. That's an excellent question. Maybe we can find a testimonial from some lady as far as, you know, what she was thinking before and after, that sort of thing. Um, That's bizarre to me. Maybe it's some sort of fetish. Yeah, that's that's even more bizarre to me than the other ones. That seems to have no purpose whatsoever. I don't I don't understand. Or even less of a purpose than the labioplasty, right. which also seems to have no purpose beyond appearance and being trying to look like a porn star or a little girl or something. Well, that's not true. There's a couple of instances where it has been necessary uh, for medical purposes, I guess. And well, these guys purposes. are saying they can't see medical purposes right. for this. And but these are other doctors. These are people who claim that they've got it done because they were uncomfortable. And, I mean, who am I to say that they weren't uncomfortable? Mm-hmm. So. Neither vaginal rejuvenation nor designer vaginoplasty have been adequately described or evaluated, according to critics. Practitioners say they tighten women's internal genitalia by making incisions and stitching muscles more firmly together. (laughs) That just does not sound good. (laughs) I don't, yeah, the thought of knives down there just really weirds me out. I don't know. Makes me uncomfortable. Yeah, somebody cut me when I was a kid, uh, and I've had enough of that cutting. (laughs) No, thanks. What are the doctors doing? We're not really sure, says Dr. Stephen Somheimer, a professor of <laughs> gynecology at the University of Pennsylvania. We have doctors contacting us and so asking. So this really hasn't been peer-reviewed in any way, Right, exactly. Right? Th- that's what these doctors are saying, is that there's really little known about the surgery, mm-hmm. and th- and there's growing numbers of women rushing out to get this. So hold off, ladies. <laughs> The risk, of course, maybe is you should that, just try loving yourself. The risk, of course, is that patients could suffer harm from the surgeries, including bleeding, scarring, infection, and altered sensation, while experiencing little or no benefit. Those would be some of my concerns. Yeah, Brew it's Baker's, surgery, man. It's dangerous. Right. Don't you remember the story we read on the air about the dentist who was, uh, you know, deciding to do that? His wife decided that she wanted some of this labiaplasty at the house, you know, so he was doing a little bit, and then uh, she decided. You know, right in the midst of it all, they they the both the two of them decided. You know, instead of just uh, trimming down the labia, let's take them both off and the clitoris too. The no, fe- I don't remember the, that. <laughs> the female circumcision story that we had read. Oh, yeah. female circumcision is nasty. Well, that's essentially you yeah. Know, that's to some extent, what, that's what we're talking about. Yeah, it here. is. You're right. It's close not as extreme. It. It's close to it though. It is mutilation. Eight hundred two five nine ninety two thirty one. Females, ladies, uh, how do you feel about this? How uh, are you interested in this surgery? If so, why? Are you interested in labiaplasty, vaginoplasty, hymenoplasty? Why? 
And do you know anybody who is? And what's your analysis of that? If you're on the outside, if you've uh, known people who are interested or have had this done, how do you feel about this? Hour 3 is on the way. You can take control. It's Free Talk Live. With your help, we can spread the message of liberty around the world. Consider becoming a Free Talk Live amplifier for just $3 a month now at amp.freetalklive.com. If you can't afford it, keep enjoying us for free. If you can spare the three, visit amp.freetalklive.com. This is Free Talk Live. We're launching into hour number three of the program. You can take control of the airwaves toll-free at 800-259-9231. We've been from everywhere from intellectual property all the way to this insanity called vaginal plastic surgery. We've been everywhere tonight, so um, bring up anything. 800-259-9231. It is Ian here with you. And Julia. And Mark. And you can join us online. Freetalklive.com is the place to go. The features on the site, we give them away. So enjoy those on us for free. Freetalklive.com. Going right into the phone calls. Let's talk to Puke in New Hampshire on the amplifier line. Hey, Puke. Good evening, all. Good evening. What's on your mind? Well, I was uh, wanted to report this story that I actually heard about from a coworker today. As he was driving into work, he uh, passed the uh, police station in Troy, New Hampshire, a small town south of Keene. Mm-hmm. And apparently a man uh, became disgruntled, stole a bulldozer, and rammed it into the <laughs> Troy police station three times, essentially uh, destroying the front of the police station. Wow. Awesome. Well, I See, can't I'll... say that I'm happy to see taxpayers' uh, you know, money destroyed in that fashion because they're simply going to build it again. And uh, But it does go to show that uh, sometimes the bureaucrats just screw with people a little too much. You push them too far, yep. and this is what happens. Yeah. Apparently this guy had over 20 uh, traffic violations or something. So yeah, it says, I've actually got the story here from the AP. Uh, it says here that uh, Stanley Bird, who's 34, said the police drove him to it. He says, I've been <laughs> harassed to the point this is uh, that this has brought this to, wearing a T-shirt at the time that depicted a construction excavator, saying, I want an investigation started. Bird has ru- had numerous run-ins with the local police, including 20 driving offenses. He recently was released after serving 12 months in the county jail after being convicted of being a habitual motor vehicle offender. In the bulldozer Ooh, incident, heard of that. he was charged with criminal mischief and reckless conduct with a deadly weapon, as well as driving and probation violations. So, you know, he pulled one too many U-turns, and the government put him in jail for 12 months, and he was a little ticked off about that. Yeah, so, well, it's probably um, not going to help him out anything what he did. But no, I likely was, not. I thought it was rather amusing when I heard this tale. Obviously, he felt like he had nothing to lose at this point. I mean, they already stole him a year of his life. He figured he'd, you know, keep messing with the cops and at that point. They want to mess with him, he's going to mess with them. It takes a real financial burden on you when you go to jail for a year. Absolutely. Well, don't, let's not forget the financial burden that's put on the taxpayer. How much money do we have to pay in order to keep this guy in jail for, for a year? Driving right. offenses. 50000 80000 $100,000 a year? Right. Not worth it. And I like at the the end of the story that I have it. It talks about a different incident by a guy who who was harassed by uh, uh, zoning battles with his town somewhere in uh, Colorado, and he actually fortified a bulldozer and went on a rampage, destroying I think it says six buildings. <laughs> yeah, there's and, video uh, footage of that. Um, you yeah, can, is that the killdozer kill story? Yeah, yeah, it's called the killdozer, and uh, yeah, he, not only did he fortify it, but he actually made it like bulletproof and that sort of thing. I mean, it was just an awesome, just this destruction vehicle, this tank uh, that he was just destroying si- the city uh, hall and the right. And as the bureaucrats station. get more and more invasive on people's lives, th- you're going to see more and more of these incidents where a man is driven to. Desperation, and he's not. It's not going to be one in a hundred. It's going to be one in a, you know, a million, a, a hundred thousand or whatever. But this is going to happen. There's, you know, there's a story from down in Florida from a few years ago where uh, some guy who just couldn't get the zoning board to uh, see things his way went into one of the city buildings and capped like five bureaucrats. There's another story from here in New Hampshire. Carl Draga, back in the late 1990s, the zoning bureaucrats would not allow him to uh, make some changes to the, his backyard, and he was just in this major uh, situation with the city over this. It wasn't any big deal what he it wanted to do. It took years and years. And uh, he eventually just, you know, popped, popped one of the people in the head and then killed a couple cops, and they took him out, um, obviously. Obviously. But, there's a, there's no winning in these circumstances. Right. And they just, they've gone out of their minds, and, they, you know, they, they're, they're 
they're fed up and they're willing to do what it takes. Right, and that's what, and that's really where it, uh, it you know, it comes to because uh, you, you know when it, when you're dealing with, in the case of Carl Draga, look, it's my backyard. I should be able to do what I want with it. I can understand where the guy is coming from. And there's all this paperwork, and they, they you want have your permit. They want all this money. Uh, you know, you do a site plan to be able to do what you want. That costs several thousand right. dollars. And then they say, no, we want such and such, so and so. You need a new site plan, another couple thousand dollars, in yeah. order for them to say no. It'd be easier to just bomb the zoning board. Yeah, it's a lot like uh, school kids. You know, when they go crazy in school, uh, you it's know, a lot like that. Yeah, yeah, where they just snap. Except up, the school kids will shoot their their fellow students, whereas people like this are actually attacking the source of the problem. Well, I think that what you just said, I mean, essentially the kids who go on these rampages shoot the fellow students who were mean to them and have been making fun of them. So it's, it's the same idea. That's a good point, yeah. Yeah, they might, you know, I, I don't know. Obviously, whenever somebody goes crazy, they're just, uh, right, they're not. who knows what's going through their head. But before I go, um, Dalebert would like me to mention that going along with the uh, surgery thing, he thinks that guys should get their tongue a uh, lengthened surgery or some crap like that. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> he, he's talking. Oh. About, he was talking about it in the um, amp ch- uh, studio cam chat room. Yeah. And he says that instead of women getting these surgeries, men should get their tongue lengthened or something. No thanks. Yeah. Thanks for the call, Pew. Appreciate it. Uh, Eight- I have enough trouble biting my tongue now and then. Yeah. I certainly wouldn't want it any longer. Yeah. 1-800-259-9231. Look, this is why what we're doing on Free Talk Live and the liberty movement is so important. Because if, if we don't turn government around, if we don't turn this incredibly large bureaucratic intrusive government around and make it drastically smaller as soon as possible, more incidents like this are going to happen. More cops are going to get killed. More buildings and city property are going to get destroyed. People are going to get arrested. There's going to be more incidents. And that just makes it, that just gives the government more of an excuse to start cracking down on people. Oh, we've got a problem with people running bulldozers into city buildings. We're going to have to put up barricades. We're going to need more police uh, presence. We need to hire more cops. We need to have cameras in the streets. I mean, the more violence you use against them, the more they're going to amp their violence up against us. And, of course, violence begets violence. So the more, the, the more we, you know, the more stuff like this happens, the more the government's going to do uh, to intrude in our lives the more stuff like this will happen, and so on and so forth. And we need to turn this around as soon as possible. That's right. Free Talk Live, saving lives every single night. We're trying to, at least. Let's go to the phones and talk to Jared in Tennessee. Jared, you're on Free Talk Live. What's on your mind? Uh, hey, everybody. Hey there. Uh, I just wanted to get in on this uh, circumcision conversation. Sure. Uh, I, I just started tuning in late, and I didn't know if you uh, discussed the male circumcision aspect. We touched well, on it, not really so right. much tonight. And we actually didn't necessarily talk about female circumcision, but female plastic surgery. Okay. But, but yeah, you're welcome so, to comment on yeah. circumcision. Yeah. What do you yeah, have to say man, about that's... male uh, genital mutilation? I wish mine hadn't been cut. Oh, uh, yeah, me too, man. I, I uh, Actually, it didn't bother me until uh, here recently. <laughs> well, I didn't even, uh, I didn't realize what I was, you know, what was truly taken from me. Right, nor, nor did I. I didn't realize it until I saw the I Penn mean, and Teller I mean, you're episode. Born, I mean, as far as you're, you know, you're born with that. I mean, I always uh, thought that was just how I was born. Right. I mean, for the longest time, obviously, not when I, I got older, but... Um, the fact is, they stole nerve endings from you. Exactly. I mean, that, I mean, that is. I mean, I. Did, and what? What is this all about? I. I don't understand. Great question. What, right. What if you wanted to surgically alter your, you know, young male child or even female child? What if you wanted to remove one of their arms? Yeah. I mean, I mean sh- uh, would, should we allow parents to do that? I well, think that circumcision is child abuse. Now, hold on. That didn't answer his question. What is it all about? Look into the history of circumcision, and you'll find that it's all about it's desensitizing thing, right? the male genitalia. And it happens there is also female circumcision, which is even worse. Right. Uh, but uh, it's all about making it so sex is less pleasurable. So, in theory, you'll want it less, which, of course, isn't true. It doesn't, I mean, yes, it may make it less pleasurable in that you don't have as many nerve endings as you did before, but it doesn't mean that you want it any less. Um, and so this was actually brought about by Puritans. It was brought about by religious freaks that uh, wanted to... Uh, Kellogg and Graham. Yep. 
The, the, Mr. Uh, Kellogg. Who make your cereal. Uh, and Graham flakes. Crackers. Uh, the, these these are the guys that went on some kind of weird, zealotist... Uh, they were uh, advocacy. Religious... Advocate, advocating it. ...crusade to, uh, you know, basically they they didn't want boys to touch themselves. They right. said that it would uh, reduce the incidence of masturbation. Self, yeah, that se- worked. Self-sullying yeah, right. or some, some <laughs> terminology well, that they used. Very well, how, bizarre stuff. How did stuff. this idea uh, propagate? How, how, how come it's, it's uh, well, maintained itself so long? Jews you know, did it outside? at one point. Fortunately, it is going down in popularity. As I understand it, it used to be in the 80s, 80% of males were circumcised. Now it's 50. Yeah, I, I heard 70s is even more. I mean, I was born in 73. Yeah. Now it's 50%. It's, so, so it's going down in popularity. That's good news. The truth is getting out. How did it propagate? Through the religious channels. People said this is what you should do to keep your kids closer to God. Doctors that sort recommend of thing. it, and they'll do it without your permission. So blame Jesus. Thanks for the call, man. We appreciate it. 800 259 9231. And was Jesus circumcised? That's a good question. This is Free yes. Talk Live. This is Free Talk Live, and it's your show. You can take control of the airwaves via the toll-free number, 1-800-259-9231, the SACL CAI toll-free line. It's Ian here with you. And Julia. And Mark. 800-259-9231. You can join us online at freetalklive.com. The feature's on the site for free, so enjoy those on us, including the live, uh, not the live streams, well, those are there, but uh, the archives. I haven't mentioned those yet. Archives, an entire year's worth of the show, front page of the website. You just go and get them. They're free at freetalklive.com. Calm. And your mattress was likely manufactured using all kinds of disturbing chemicals. Does this bother you? Well, it bothers some scientists, especially in the case of young children. Savvy Rest mattresses are made of 100% natural latex rubber, organic wool, and organic cotton. Try their crib mattresses, too. SavvyRest.com for the sleep you've been dreaming of. That's SavvyRest.com. Not only are they healthy, they're darn comfy, too. No doubt about it. Uh, let's go to the phones, to the fun. Talk to the Gord Captain in Ohio. You're on Free Talk Live. Hello. Hello. Hey, what's on your mind? Um, first, I'm going to tell you a story about possibly the weirdest substitute teacher I've ever had in the fifth grade. Sound a bit like some of your conspiracy callers. Okay. You see, you see, in the fifth grade, during orchestra class, my orchestra teacher never shows up half the time. Well, more like 25% of the time still. Who's anyway, coming? Go so, ahead. So we have to go to the theater because none of the substitutes actually know anything about orchestra. And have a study hall. Only problem is that the substitute starts talking about herself and, you know, how, you know, she used to be in the Soviet Union, how America is so wonderful and stuff. But then she notes how she's glad to be away since the KGB killed her brother in the middle of the 1990s. Hmm. And then, you know, how the Soviet Union never really went either, just hiding and they'll nuke us when we least expect it. Yeah, that seems a little paranoid. Uh, I'm pretty sure the KGB was not around in the middle of the 1990s, but I'm sure the uh, conspiracy theorists believe differently. I think it's G U R took took over for the uh, KGB. G R U. Uh, yeah, I'm definitely not involved with the KGB anyway, and d- denying their theory. So yeah. Anyway, she then furthermore said this was okay because she's going to die anyway because she smokes cigarettes every day, mm-hmm. and that'll kill her off with a couple of years. But she's again fine with that because the entire world's going to end in 2012 anyway when an asteroid hits the Earth, killing off all life. Sweet. Pretty awesome. You'd think if uh, an asteroid was going to hit Earth and uh, you know change everything, that the scientists would be frantically coming up with some system to take care of this asteroid. I mean, if we could uh, divert this asteroid right now, it wouldn't take much, uh, you know, because obviously it's out somewhere as far as Jupiter or Neptune or something like that. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't take much of a uh, divergence to keep it away from Earth. A a, a pinprick, a pebble plunked against it right now would, would, you know, it would miss us by hundreds of thousands of miles. Yeah, you're probably right about that. Oh, yeah, but that would be a Michael Bay film that's a fate worse than death. But anyway. (laughs) You didn't like Transformers? I haven't seen it. I have seen The Island. Armageddon and Pearl Harbor. Yeah. I Pearl haven't Harbor seen, and the island? Ooh, I, I haven't w- seen any of those, and I've heard they're not so great, but uh, I, I've seen The Rock, and I really enjoyed that one. That uh, I'll fun. have to take your word for that. But anyway, but after that, <laughs> she, you know, she, you know, said, she said she developed a tale for time to tell you. You see, she lived in the skyscraper, and one day there was an earthquake, and, it col- and the building collapsed on top of her. Luckily, she somehow may end up underneath a bathtub, so she lived through the earthquake. But the problem was it was several days before she was rescued, and she was starting to get thirsty. So she found this nearby butcher's knife, apparently underneath the bathtub. Mm-hmm. wonder how it got there. But anyway, but you know, she was so desperate, she cut her wrists and started drinking the blood to stay alive. I don't know and if that would work. Really would would that, that work? It, it tasted good. Yeah, she's pretty weird, man. Thanks for the stories. We appreciate it. 
You'd um, think you would centric old substitute teacher. You'd think you would uh, go for, like the miners did uh, uh, there recently, you'd think you'd go for urine before you went for blood. Now, did, did they find any of those miners? I mean, I saw a I story. I read something today um, that, in fact, I don't know, that they, they proposed what the miners had done. I don't know. I, I think that Are they, they alive? I don't know the answer. I cannot answer. Because uh, I heard something on the radio it's earlier. It's not the kind of st- story we normally do, so I just kind of skimmed over right. it. I heard something about them talking about the, making jokes about their wives, uh, drinking urine, and um, you know, eating coal. That's what I remember eating reading Eating coal? Wow. Yeah, I mean, I'll have to look it, into that. Because it has to be biological at some point, right? I was, I was very curious about that because the miners, you're talking about the Utah miners, right? Uh, yes, the, that's uh, what I believe I'm talking about. The, I am almost entirely uninformed in this. I saw a headline. Today. I don't know a lot, but as what I understand is they got caught down in the mine. They sent in a rescue team to drill and get them out. Three of the rescue team members got killed in a, some sort of a, a, a cave-in, and then they called, called it off. Then earlier this week, I heard something on uh, radio news uh, about how they're trying again, about how they're, they're continuing to, d- to drill in three weeks later. And I'm thinking, three weeks? They really ha- they don't have water under there? How can they possibly make it that long? I, Maybe they did. I don't know. Anyway, we'll, uh, we'll look into it. Maybe we can find the story. 800-259-9231. Uh, let's see, real quick here. According to DailyTech.com, there's, in 2004, history professor Naomi... Orxies performed a survey of research papers on climate change, examining peer-reviewed papers published on the ISI Web of Science database between 1993 and 2003. She found a majority of scientists supported the consensus view, defined as humans, they're talking about global warming, humans were having at least some effect on global climate change. Orxies' work has been repeatedly cited, but as some of its data is now nearly 15 years old, its conclusions are becoming, well, somewhat dated. Medical researcher Dr. Klaus Martin Schult recently updated this research. Using the same database and the same search terms as the original researcher, he examined all papers published from 2004 to February of 2007. The results have been submitted to the Journal of Energy and Environment, of which Daily Tech has obtained a pre-publication copy. The figures are surprising. Of 528 total papers on global climate change... Only 38, or 7%, gave an explicit endorsement of the consensus. If one considers implicit endorsement, accepting the consensus without explicit statement, the figure rises to 45%. However, while only 32 papers reject the consensus outright, which is 6%, the largest category, 48%, are neutral papers, refusing to either accept or to reject the hypothesis. Conclusion, there is no consensus. There's no consensus on global warming, period. On global climate change, no consensus. So not even whether it's How human. How could there be? Not it's not even whether it's uh, human made. They, they're, the scientists aren't even. Oh, I think they think it's it, there's some changes going. On. I mean, we we've known it's it's getting a little warmer, but uh, I, I, but that's not what this addresses. What's this, it address? This is addressing that humans were having some effect on okay. global climate change. Okay. Are humans a factor? Is the question. To so that, there is no there consensus. Is no consensus. Right, and I, that's absolutely the truth. By the way, I did look up on uh, Google. It was the chi- it was some Chinese miners that they found that managed to survive. I heard that story too. Okay. Yeah. But, well, how, why the hell didn't you save me? I thought we were talking about the Utah miners. How did I know? I said I read a story today. Well, anyway, there you go. Thanks. Got my back, partner. So, um, the uh, the global warming. Yeah, there, I was just <laughs> letting you know on that. I, uh, I, I, I thought it. You know, that's what we've been saying all along. Um, on well, Free how Talk could Live, there the be idea a consensus? That, yeah, the, yeah, the idea that there is a consensus as far as what's causing the how climate to change. How could anybody know? I mean, how could how could you go about finding out what causes climate to change? Is, I, I guess I, you'll have to go ask the six percent that claim that the humans are indeed responsible. Well, the, you know, I know what they're claiming. They're claiming there's more carbon dioxide in the air now, and uh, we're you know our combustion engines are causing an increase in carbon dioxide, and uh, you know temperatures go up when there's more carbon dioxide. So poof, it's us. But what they fail to take into account is, you know, what's referred to as, in the 1400s as the medieval warm period. Like, for instance, when Greenland was actually green and when people thought it was a good idea to get on Iceland and populate the place. They it also, was warmer then. They also failed to take into account, and you're not scientists, but they also failed to take into account things that humans couldn't possibly affect, like, you know, the temperature of the sun and how close it is to the earth, that sort of thing. More on the way. You can take control. This is Free Talk Live. One of the bonuses you'll get as a Free Talk Live amplifier is access to our classic archives. 
For just $3 a month, you can become an amplifier, and you'll help us get on more radio stations and MP3 players. Get the details at amp.freetalklive.com. That's amp.freetalklive.com. This is Free Talk Live, your show. You bring up what you want. The toll-free number is 800-259-9231. The SACL CAI toll-free line for you. Ian here with you. And Julia. And Mark. You can join us online at freetalklive.com. The features on our site we give away, so enjoy those on us, including the Shrine of Female listeners, dozens of ladies who've taken the time to send us their validated photo to prove they listen to the show. See what I mean by heading over to shrine.freetalklive.com, shrine.freetalklive.com. Do you have a company that needs to try something new in the area of collections? SACL CAI does collections, they do early out billing, and they purchase charged off receivables. SACL's employees are trained in resolving issues for your customers and treating them with respect. They know that not only do you want to collect your money, but you want to keep those clients too. SACL CAI. Check out their banner at freetalklive.com or call 800-544-6359. Do business with businesses that support Free Talk Live. I think we should get to a story that we mentioned earlier this week, just didn't have time to get to. It's uh, another California story, since we've got our friends out in KSCO land listening in uh, Santa Cruz and San Jose. Uh, Mark, you had a story about a field, a Little League field, that was being harassed by, or the owner of which is being harassed by the zoning board, right? Yeah. And the planning commission, or whatever they're called out there. You know, you always wonder with these uh, sort of planning board stories, was this the original intent of the voters? When we put in place a planning board... Did, did the we... voters put in place a planning board? I, I don't, don't think so. I don't so. even know. I would imagine they had to vote on it at some point I imagine or another. They, I imagine what happened is they voted in certain city councilors, and then the city councilors went ahead and created the zoning board. I don't think you I don't think voters are asked to approve all of the boards and commissions that government creates. Perhaps which, not. Which we got a when we went to I'm filing for city council here and we went to You have the, filed actually. Actually yes I have filed and I'm already getting nasty emails from Paul Polit- slimy politicians. You sure are. In fact it's getting kind of dirty. In fact out he's there. probably listening right now. He might be. Hi Fred <laughs> <laughs> a man built a baseball field for his 11-year-old son and his son's little league team. But this is not some fairy tale where the ghost of shoeless Joe Jackson emerges from a cornfield to join the game. <laughs> this is Danville, not Iowa. Someone did arrive to check out the Field of Dreams, but it was a city building inspector. The story heads into the late innings tonight when Danville's planning commission is set to weigh in on an unusual property dispute. It pits... David Lowe, who built the field without permits in a picturesque ridgeline. How pi- dare he! Right, on a picturesque ri- ridgeline against neighbors below who say the field's 14-foot high fence screams prison wall and obscures million-dollar views. Oh, well, let's just take the fence down and then all the balls can go fall, uh, fly through your windows. Yeah, what do you, what do you think about that uh, picturesque view? Baseball coming through your window. Lowe, a private equity investor, spends hundreds of thousands of dollars on spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on the field, which. Um, has Is there f- barbed wire on the top of the fence? What are you talking about, a prison view? I what sort know. of madness is infecting these people? It has uh, artificial turf, an enclosed batting cage with a motorized pitching machine, hookups for electricity and water. The views gave San Francisco's AT&T Park a uh, run for its money. Mount Diablo to the east, Las Trampas National uh, Park to the west, Old Oaks all around. Lowe calls it a place for neighborhood children to play baseball. His son, Greg, calls it really cool. Yeah. Opponents call cool. it Guantanamo Bay because of its <laughs> fences. <laughs> Come on. This is satire, right? This is, for, is, is this real? I, I, yes, absolutely. It's out of SF, um, sfgate.com. My goodness. Yep. Sorry about that. Um, the neighbors, many of whom are wealthy, would not build... Um, th- um, excuse me. The though, neighbors, many of whom have forgotten what fun is all about. Right, they're wealthy, though not build your own ball field wealthy. Want it removed as soon as possible. Rejecting Lowe's... A Turn that into to hide, a parking lot. To hide it by planting tall trees, uh, tall trees. You know, this is this seems to be the problem, the biggest problem in the wealthy neighborhoods. This wouldn't be a problem in a you know a regular old working class neighborhood. They'd be happy to have the ballpark. Mm. But once people seem to get enough money, they believe they own everything that they can survey from their property. Mm. This <laughs> is how it was at Longboat Key, where I came from, Sarasota, Florida. You know, the the rich people zone and regulate the crap out of each other to the point where you can't change the color of your carpet. You, you think it's because they just don't have anything better to do? Like, all they want to do is control everybody else? I don't know. Maybe they fancy themselves all kings. 
Just it's ludicrous. It's a sickness. It's some sort of uh, disease, some sort of mental infection that these people have uh, that they just want to control other people's property. I don't like the color of your house, and your I'm going to too char- high. You're gonna you're gonna have to cut those bushes. Shut up. Go get and a life. Some of the rules are so ludicrous. Absolutely true. I lived in a, uh, a community where they had a problem with uh, a sago palm that I had, uh, that, that a neighbor had. That's that an I unapproved had. palm, sir. It really, it, you know, they called it a bush rather than a tree. <laughs> it's a palm tree. It, of course, it's it, so it got above three feet, and the guy wasn't allowed to have it anymore. They, they, they made him cut down his sagos. Unbelievable. Crazy stuff. It, but... You know, it, these these planning boards and these bureaucrats, in this case, it's uh, it was, uh, in fact, a building inspector. But We don't want our neighborhood to look like kids are having fun around here. Yeah, God no knows. No fun allowed in Danville. So, That's what's going on. Is that it? Is the end of the story? No, I can, I can continue I want to quotes. read on. All right. I want quotes from these idiots. Give me an excuse. Danville planners agree, citing local rules preserving of course they do. major ridge lines. They recommend that the commission turn down a permit application that Lowe belatedly filed. The squabble could end up before the town council and the courts after that. In theory, the town could force the field's dismantling. Of course it could. In fact, what else is fa- it going to do? Well, after the fact, this guy's filing for the permit after he's already done the job. He has violated the rules, and so therefore they, they can just wipe it out if they want, mm-hmm. at, at, probably at his cost. And uh, they don't have to accept the permit, but if they do, that belated permit will cost probably ten times as much as the original permit would have. And it's all just which he knew he wouldn't get. I bet you he knew he wouldn't get the permit because of all the you know muckety mucks that are living there that don't like kids having fun in their neighborhood. So he just figured, eh, I'll go for it. See what happens. Ask forgiveness instead of permission. Yeah, it's a good way to live life. Is the next guy going to point to a football field on the ridgeline? Um, neighbor Terry Rousseau asked while um, pointing into the black fence in her backyard. Wait, and what? Did, wait, wait. Is this what? what is the, the next guy going to put a football field on the ridgeline? Apparently, Terry. Uh, Tennis courts. What's going? What? Well, this Rousseau. is basketball. What do we want? All these sports around here. Get this out of here. Mm-hmm. We just want to die and uh, watch our television and garden. In places like Danville, every plan to build on a ridge is controversial and tightly regulated. Planners are used to, uh, to dealing with monster homes being plopped in once pristine hills. But say, this is their first time dealing with a ball field on a ridge. You Lowe's, ruined our ridge. And, right. That, that's, that's the way it is. It's like their ridge. You didn't buy the ridge. Right. Just because you can see the ridge from your house doesn't make it yours. Shut up, Otherwise, you old bat. If, if I'm your neighbor and I can see your car, I should be able to go and take it away from you. <laughs> I mean, these people are crazy. Right. The Lowe's neighbors spent a lot of money on their houses and were counting on having a rural feel, said uh, Vice Mayor Candace Anderson. Then buy it. No, hold on just a second. To have a rural feel, that's that's ludicrous. To think that you're going to build a house or buy a house and that there's never going to be any progress afterwards is absolutely nuts and not that's what the people point of would want. Commissions. In fact, each one of these people would like to have something uh, built in their neighborhood, whether it's on a ridge line or whatever, they would like to have something, whether it's a Walmart to make life more convenient or a Target or a Macy's or a Nordstrom's mm. or, I, I don't know, a, a Major League football, whatever it is. There's something out there that would make their life better, but they don't want anyone else to have a better life. Sure. And that's the selfishness that's propagated by these zoning boards. It absolutely is. By the way, um, I, I always like to bring up an example of... Uh, People say, well, oh, my God, we'd have chaos without zoning boards. Houston. Yep. One of the major um, ten metros in the United States, Houston, has Number seven, no zone zoning uh, board or anything like that. And as an example, people will say, well, I, I, Houston sounds like crap then. I wouldn't want to be there. Well, in fact, the property uh, values inside of Houston are more valuable than self-contained than contained communities. Communities right. that are inside, completely inside the Houston city limits – that have their own zoning regulations. And this is fascinating, too. Julie and I were ta- actually talking about this today in that, you know, the scary, t- the scare tactic is that if somebody advocates the abolition of a zoning board, inevitably the objection that comes up is, well, what if they open up, uh, you know, a junkyard next to me? And uh, we'll address this here in a moment. Well, I want to get one more quote here from the uh, vice mayor, Candace Anderson. My first... Well, you should hold it. Oh, you should it's hold so it. good. It's so good. So hold All on right. to it, okay? We'll, t- we'll keep talking about zoning. And uh, if you've got a zoning nightmare story you want to share if with us... If you live in the Bay Area of uh, California, <laughs> you do. 
1-800-259-9231. Give us the worst busybody you've ever come across. This is Free Talk Live. This is Free Talk Live, only home of Jermaine, but just enough time for your call. 800-259-9231 is the SACL CAI toll free line. That's 1-800-259-9231. We're talking zoning, and there's always a new zoning hell story out there to share with you. This one happens to come from Danville, California. And before we talk about Houston and why they're different and special there, uh, you said you had a, a quote to share. But real quick to recap the story, in Danville, they are there's some old, you know, some muckety mucks that are complaining. Right, because, a nice guy builds a, a, a park for the kids to play baseball in, and the neighbors, some of the neighbors, um, say it looks like Guantanamo Bay. It's got a big, it's not, it's not a ridge line. It's got a big wall and stuff. It's, it's ruining terrible. our rural well, field. Well, if it's a baseball field, shouldn't it have a wall so that baseballs don't go flying into people's windows? Well, that would. They that, just don't like it at all. They're just coming up with excuses as to why they don't like it. Anyway, that's just one example. If you've got a story for us, one eight hundred two five nine ninety two thirty one. But you had a quote from the mayor on that particular case. Was that right? right? Um, this is the vice mayor, Candace Anderson, says. My first thought when I saw the fence was. What were they thinking? It's a really nice thing to do for the kids, but you have to follow the rules. Or else. Right. It, you know, I understand that the vice mayor would be concerned with the rules and that kind of thing, but at some point the rules get so restrictive. Mm-hmm. The rules, the rules aren't the, the most important thing in the world. For instance, right. if the uh, family that hid Anne Frank had followed the rules... They would have died in a gas chamber. Not mm. the, the family, but the you know the, the Franks would have, which yeah. finally Anne Frank did die. But, but not in a gas chamber. But it was following the rules. And right. so the rules, the, the, the road to hell is paid with your damn rules, Candace. Yeah, screw your rules. The fact is, the kids do need a place to play ball, and to have a nice park is a very good thing. I understand that you don't want your uh, that people don't want their little ridge lines covered when uh, buildings and that kind of thing, but they don't own the ridge lines. If they don't want the w- ridge lines covered in buildings, buy them. Let them buy them. Yep. Because if I own a piece of ridge line, I should be able to build what I want on it. Thank you very much. I don't care if it's your view or not. You damn right. Was that the end of that uh, no, quote? No, it, 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 it's the end of the quote. Okay. Uh, so we were talking about Houston, right? right. This unzoned no. city. Right. It's, it's city. by no means a mecca for liberty or anything like no. that, but it is an anomaly in America. Right. It's the seventh metro in the United States, so it's a rather large place, and somehow good portions of the city managed to go without a zoning board at all. Now, because it's such a large city, there are some areas within Houston that are, you know, little incorporated areas. Right, sort there's of like other towns inside of Houston, that towns or cities zoned, or whatever you want to call them. That, yes, that do have these, plan- these centralized planning boards. Mm-hmm. You know, the people that sit around and they've got their college degrees and <laughs> I'm an expert in urban sprawl and we're going to make our city very beautiful and so you I would, know everything. You would think having <laughs> these experts uh, employed and elected inside these cities, um, these municipalities inside of Houston, that, you know, it's in the very same area that, in fact, property values would be higher in the planned areas. To prove. Wouldn't you? Would, isn't that the idea behind a planning board? Right. Is that, and somehow it's going to make our property um, values better. Yeah, but in fact, it's sort of not what? true. What's the difference between a planning board and a zoning board? Because there's both in Houston. They, they call them, the, you know, they're pretty much the same. Well, you know, zoning's what you're allowed to build there, and then planning's, I, I, they've got a larger view. Really? I don't even know. I, oh, you know, okay. it, it, And it varies from municipality to so municipality. But. You would think that they'd be, you know, they'd have a proof of concept, that they'd be able to say, well, look at us, we've got these high property values and we're zoned and you're not. Uh, But in fact, the unzoned areas rise in property value far faster than the other areas that are zoned. You have to ask yourself, why is that? Well, it's because the marketplace allocates resources better than central planning boards. That's the short version of, of the answer. But the other thing is that in freedom... In a in a free situation, and as far as we're talking about zoning and building property and you know upgrading property and all that is concerned, yeah, you are taking a risk by living in an unzoned area, by living in an area where someone could come in and trash their yard and park cars all over the place and make their property look relatively ugly. In theory, that could bring your property down in value. It, it will also make your property look better. So that's the other side of the coin. But, uh, but you know, that is a risk that you are taking by moving into an unzoned area. The other side of that coin, however, 
is the other side of the risk, and that is that because you are unzoned, because there is no centralized bureaucracy you have to go to and beg for permission and pay thousands of dollars to get their permission to do things, because people have that freedom, they can take the money that they would have paid in permits or whatever and take that and put it into their property. They can upgrade their property without asking for permission. They can do all kinds of creative, original things that don't have to you know, uh, bow down to the code and to the official rule book. And because of that freedom, people can upgrade their property without having to ask permission. They can upgrade it faster. They can do it better. They can do it more affordably. And they can do different, more original things, thereby making property values skyrocket rocket in comparison to the zoned controlled areas. Now, the first thing that you're going to hear from somebody who's uh, you know new to this concept of getting rid of a zoning board is going, "What about oh, what if my neighbor wanted to start mining for oil next to, next door neighbor How about a dump? To, How about uh, a yeah, garbage or make dump? a dump or, or start a pig farm?" Well, okay. Let's let's I'm I'm not going to use terms like ignorant and uh, not know anything about economics. I'm not going to, you know, go banding about ad hominem attacks like that. But why don't you go downtown to the most select piece of real estate, knock down the 50-story skyscraper, and put a house there? Because it's not economically feasible. It's right. a dumb thing to do. It would be dumb to take a city lot inside of your, um, you know, in your suburban or urban area or whatever, take a city lot and turn it into a pig farm. Pig right. farms need to be big so you can have a bunch of pigs. You, you make pig farms out in rural areas. That way you can afford the land. Why why don't they go tear down the Empire State Building and put a pig farm there? <laughs> God. Um, you know, and why wouldn't they mine for oil? Well, for one, it's likely that there isn't any oil in downtown New York City, Manhattan. Right. But and, and if there was oil, then, you know, maybe it would be valuable enough. You'd have to do a cost-benefit analysis or anything mm -hmm. like that. And also, we have laws for disturbing the peace and bothering your neighbors and those kind of things. If you're creating a foul odor at your house... I'm sure that there's some municipal ordinance about that. If you're making a bunch of noise that keeps people up at night, absolutely. Like the clanking of uh, oil rigs, Der <laughs> Derek sucking the oil out of the God knows where, Danville. Um, <laughs> right. You know, the ground in Danville, uh, uh, California. Now, I wonder, I wonder what's the difference, because we know that the zoned areas don't rise in property value as fast as the unzoned areas. But what about deed restricted? I'm not uh, sure that that's entirely true every time, but it does. Here is a great case. It has in been Houston. the case in Houston, right? The only place in the United States where we can really make a good example, right? Because the rest of the unzoned areas are like Grafton, New Hampshire, which is nothing. Right? You there's know, nobody there's nothing there. there. Uh, so it's a it's a brilliant uh, example to look at. And indeed, there are some you know anomalies. You know, there's uh, there are houses that are uh, that are next to the you know the the place the school buses are parked and that sort of thing. But okay, so. Don't live there if that's you know if that's where you don't want to live. Don't Somebody live has there. to live next to where the school buses are parked. Right, and the fact is, that, you know, that's an interesting point in that the thing that uh, that lack of zoning brings is total creativity in the marketplace as far as well, you know, you've got these school buses that are parked in this place, and it might be convenient to have the school bus people maybe living nearby right. there. Absolutely, you never know what the marketplace is going to do in a given circumstance. What if I want to live in town? I don't want to live way outside of town and, and make the long drive, but I can't afford most of the houses in town, but there does happen to be one that's sort of in this warehouse district kind of thing, yeah. and I can afford that. Who is the zoning board to tell me that I shouldn't be able to have that house, that that should house shouldn't exist? Mark, well, I'll tell you who they are. They're a bunch of officious bureaucrats that think they know better than you. Mark, they're educated. There is a hotel here. I guess you could call it a hotel or a motel, the motel here in the Valley Green. <laughs> and it's one of the trashiest. I call it a no-tell yeah. motel. <laughs> <laughs> the it's words the crack and hooker yeah. come up when I look at that place. Exactly. It's awful to look at. It's just atrocious. And uh, there was some talk, I guess, of somebody buying the property. Right, a, turning a, it into a nice hotel. Right, a four-story. They have bought it. They yeah, brought the they property. bought the property and they want to turn it into a hotel. And there are the zoning board is considering not letting them do it because right. they said that they don't know if that's too big for them. Right, the, the neighbors in the community are like, oh, my goodness. Four stories, it could block out the sun. <laughs> you know, God knows what these people are talking about. But the fact is, you're going to have some Luddite. If it, it, Go far and wide enough and ask enough people, you will find some Luddite that doesn't want to do whatever good, honest, hardworking thing it is that you want to do. You want to feed the poor with, you know, by genetically reconstructing our waste. You imagine the greatest 
plan right. ever. Now, some jerk will come along and have some reason that he doesn't want it done. Let's just keep things how they are. What's with all this change? You know, uh, progress the, is overrated. I got no problem with conservatives, but I do have a problem with people that are against change just to be against change. Right. And against change in order to control other people's freedom and to control other people's property. If you don't want to change, then you can just buy up a bunch of land, and you can live on it your whole life, and you'll never see another person walk by, and you'll never get to see new hairstyles or new clothing or new buildings going up or anything new. You can just stay all by yourself. It's possible. You can live that life. It has been Ian here with you. And Julia. And Mark. We'll return tomorrow night for the live Saturday edition. You can join us online in the meantime at freetalklive.com. DVD, books, music, instruments, periodicals, computers, software, electronics, photo, cell phone, office product, home and garden, bed and bath, furniture, kitchen, pet supply, automotive, hardware, apparel, shoes, jewelry, grocery, healthcare, sports and outdoors, toys, games, used and more. It's a department store at your fingertips. Amazon.freetalklive.com. Get all your shopping done, a great deal, delivery to your door, and a percentage of your purchase will go to Free Talk Live when you enter Amazon through Amazon.freetalklive.com.